<laughs> I'd like to call the meeting of the Curry Tuck County Planning Board today, November the 14th, in session. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. We have a quorum present tonight with five of our members here. Do I hear a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. I second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the agenda. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Oh, never mind. Any opposition? Okay. The next thing is to ask for disqualifications. And let me read this. In accordance with the State Government Ethics Act, it is the duty of every board member to avoid conflicts of interest. Does any board member have any known conflict of interest with respect to any matters coming before the board today? If so, please identify the conflict and refrain from any participation in that particular matter involved. Okay, we'll note that there is none. Uh, I would entertain a motion for approval of the August 8th, 19th, 2017. I saw a motion. Okay. South second. All right, we have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of August the 8th, 2017. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition say no. So approved. To my knowledge, we have no old business. Anybody have anything old business? All righty, we're going to move right along to new business. Okie dokie. First item <laughs> is PB 1706 Miller Homes and Building LLC request for zoning map amendment of 1.05 acres from agriculture to mix residential located at 155 Survey Road, tax map 15, lot 47B, Moyock Township. And Ms. Glave, I believe this is yours. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Just to orient you, um, if I can get my mouse to move here, Caratoke Highway is to the north. Sorry, I'm stuck here. Here we go. Um, Moyock Middle School is in this area here. The new um, Lakeview subdivision that you may see some activity going on is just across the street from this parcel. And then, of course, Eagle Creek subdivision is further this way. This parcel is owned agricultural. Um, the majority property to the, west, to the east is general business. Um, to the north is agricultural. To the west is that um, SFM zoning, but you see the stripes because that's a PUD overlay. That's a carryover from our previous ordinance. Um, this is the land use classification map, and you can see that it is um, it has a full service zoning designation or land use designation. This is the Moyock Small Area Plan classification map, and um, the small area plan also designates this lot as full service. This is a proposed site plan offered by the applicant. If you're familiar um, with the property, this is a double wide that's on the property. And then this is a steel manufactured building in the back. Um, just to summarize the agenda um, request, it is a conventional rezoning from ag or agricultural to MXR, which is mixed residential. Um, since it is a conventional rezoning and not a conditional rezoning, it, you cannot place any conditions on the property. 
you should assume that the property could be used for all uses and densities allowed in the MXR district. The applicant does state that the rezoning is for small bakery and possible residential use, but that is not a binding condition that you can place on the rezoning. Um, I'm going to go through these concerns. I don't want to read verbatim to you, so I'm going to kind of briefly summarize the concerns. Um, staff is concerned that the request is potentially illegal spot zoning. The School of Government defines spot zoning as a zoning ordinance or amendment which singles out and reclassifies a relatively small tract owned by a single person and surrounded by a much larger area uniformly zoned so as to oppose upon the smaller tract greater restrictions than those um, imposed on the larger tract. Um, the proposed new rezoning requirement for the smaller area is either more or less strict than those in the surrounding area. And uses allowed in a conventional MXR district not allowed in the existing ag district may be incompatible with the neighborhood. In determining whether something is legal spot zoning or illegal spot zoning, there are five factors that we need to discuss. Um, the first factor is that an emphasis is placed on a very limited number of property owners being involved. And a quote from um, an Institute of Government paper says it's usually triggered by efforts to secure special benefits for particular particular property owners without regard for rights of adjacent properties. Um, it's important to remind the board that the property is um, just at an acre, 1.05 acres. Um, if, as the property exists, and if it were developed for residential use, the applicant can place one unit per acre on the property. If it's rezoned to MXR and the developer employs sustainable development practices, the density could triple on this property from one single family dwelling <coughs> unit per acre to three. Um, dwelling units are allowed to have accessory dwelling units, so there could, in fact, be six dwelling units per acre on the 1.5 acre parcel. Um, the majority of the property that we looked at to the east was zoned general business. They are required to have a 40,000 square foot minimum lot size, um, which is much greater than the approximately 15,000 square foot lot size in the MXR district. The ag zone lots, um, the ag property behind and to the north um, would have to have 30,000 square foot lots. The planned development across the street, get back to the map for you. The planned development across the street here has most similar lot sizes, but the density is dissimilar in that it is a um, little over a unit less per acre, and that um, PUD had to have open space requirements and amenities. The second factor of validity is the size of the tract. Um, the zoning map is for a single 1.5 acre parcel owned by a single property owner. Staff is concerned that that small size is an invalid size for legal spot zoning. Um, the third factor of validity is compatibility with adopted plans. The request appears to be incompatible with the land use plan, but compatible with the Moyoc small area plan. The rezoning is inconsistent with the Moyoc megasites emphasis to cluster moderate to high residential density within or near the Moyoc megasite. The closest MXR zoning is the applicant's conditional MXR zone property approximately 2.5 <coughs> miles to the north of this property, and that is at the entrance of the Shingle Landing subdivision. Um, the fourth factor of validity is that the balance of benefits and detriments. The benefits to the single property owner are a detriment to adjoining properties, the rezoning will allow for smaller lots than allowed in neighboring districts if the property is subdivided. And the fifth factor of validity is the relationship of use. 
A residential use is consistent with the residential uses in the area. Several of the non-residential uses allowed in the MXR could in fact be considered incompatible with the neighborhood. And while there's no specific set size for what's considered um, illegal spot zoning, um, it should be pointed out that the smaller the lot, the more likely the rezoning would be held invalid. And now we go to the UDO review standards. And there are 11 standards in the UDO that must be met in order to rezone a piece of property. The first, that it's consistent with the goals, objectives, and land use plans and other applicable county plans and the purpose of this ordinance. The density of three units per acre is consistent with the land use plan and the small area plan. Um, the request is inconsistent with land use plan policy HN1. I won't read all of these to you. Um, it is consistent with the policies of the small area plan, some of which are IS1 and <coughs> ST1. Number two, is in conflict with any provisions of this ordinance or the code of ordinances. Um, it's staff's opinion that it's in conflict with the general statute regulation regarding legal spot zoning. It's required by change condition. Staff is not aware of conditions that change to warrant the rezoning. Number four, it addresses a dis demonstrated community need. Staff is not aware of a demonstrated community need for the rezoning. Five, is compatible with existing and proposed uses surrounding the land subject to the application. Single family residential use is compatible with surrounding single family residential uses. A neighborhood serving commercial use is compatible with the planned neighborhood serving commercial uses across the street. It's staff's opinion that this is not the appropriate zoning district for the land based on the illegal spot zoning and other concerns expressed earlier. Number six, um, the rezoning adversely impacts nearby land. It is staff's opinion that the rezoning will ad adversely impact nearby lands because the increase in density will relieve the small tract from restrictions which the rest of the area is subject to. And I've called those out as lot size and density. Um, will the rezoning result in logical and orderly development patterns? An MXR zone would result in an illogical and disorderly development pattern as the MXR request is not remarkably similar to the PUD or the GB zoning in the area. The size of the request, requested zoning district of 1.05 acres is remarkably dissimilar to the PUD, which is 74.34 acres, and the general business that is 64.79 acres. And while the PUD has the most similar lot sizes, its density is less and it must include 35% open, open space and amenities. Number eight, would the rezoning result in significant adverse impacts on the natural environment? Staff is not aware of any inverse, adverse impacts on the natural environment because of the proposed rezoning. Number nine, would the rezoning result in development that is adequately served by public facilities? There are adequate public facilities to serve this request. Number 10, the rezoning would not result in significant adverse impacts on the land values in the surrounding area. There is no evidence presented as to the impact on land values in the surrounding area. And finally, number 11, would not conflict with the public interest and is in harmony with the purpose and intent of this ordinance. It is staff's opinion that the rezoning would conflict with the public interest and is not in harmony with the purpose and intent of the ordinance. As such, staff does recommend for denial of this rezoning request subject to the following inconsistencies and it, the things we just went over. It's in conflict with general statutes, with some policies of the land use plan. Um, it's not required by change conditions. There's not a demonstrated community need. It's not the appropriate zoning district and use for the land. 
it adversely impacts nearby lands and it conflicts with public interest and lack of harmony with the purpose and intent of the ordinance. If the board finds that the rezoning is valid spot zoning, staff does provide some, a statement of consistence and reasonableness that you'll, that you may want to consider. Um, and the applicant or, or his engineer, Mark Bissell included in this um, packet an argument that this is legal spot zoning. So you will want to hear from him as well. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, your floor is open for questions of, of staff. I have any questions about it? No questions? Not at this time, no. Okay. Uh, who is here representing the applicant? I am, ma'am. My name is Sam Miller. I'm the applicant. Please step forward. I also have Mark Bissell with me as well. Mark is prepared to go If you would please step forward and enter, we need your name and address. Yes, ma'am. My name is Sam Miller. I live at 147 Sanderson Court in Moyock, North Carolina, 27958. Carry on. All right. Mr. Bissell and I have taken time to review the documents prepared by the staff and provide that to us. And I'd like to take some time and review some of that as well. So I prepared some additional notes, my notes as well for this document as well, what Mr. Bissell or Mark and I have reviewed as well. So with your permission, I'd like to provide those to you as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What we've attempted to do is prepare the other perspective of this discussion and gone through reviewing the comments from staff and having discussion. Um, I'd like to start with a, the point that my wife has a bakery at home. She has a small bakery. I'm a developer. I do development work. My wife's been home for probably since uh, we got married back in 07, and she's been with the kids since then. So now all the kids are in school, and she's finally reached a point in her life where she doesn't have to take care of somebody all day because they're at school, and she said, you know, I want to do something. And I said, what would you like to do? And she would like to stretch her wings and open a bakery. She has. She's a licensed home baker. She has that. We got four ovens at home, we got two sinks, two dishwashers, and the kitchen's constantly full of cookies, cakes, pies, you name it. And her company is LJ Beaners. And you can order stuff for the holiday season if you want at ljbeaners.com, but that's a whole separate meeting. The, the short of it is, we saw the property because our daughter goes to Moyak Middle School, and I said, hey, would you like to maybe do something with this? There was a for sale by owner sign. We bought it, we bought it in the name of our construction company because that's where we had the funds available and you know for other tax and other implication reasons that's why it's the name of that company so we went through it looked at that property and said you know this property probably fit well we have gb to the right we got sfm here we've got eagle creek we got the school you know a mixed use which allows for business and in the event that a bakery business which i was perfectly honest with my wife 85 percent of the bakery started in the united states fail within two years i said if it fails we need to have a plan b so we started talking with Mr. Woody at that time, at Ben, which I'm sure you all probably know well and probably respect well. I mean, he was a, a very good director of planning. And we started working with Tammy as well at that time. And upon review, what options were for this property to rezone it, whether we rezone it GB or something else, obviously we can't put a bakery up in ag. It's not permissible. So we need to do something with it. And we're surrounded by G, GB unconditional by the way I'll make note of that as well there are no conditions on any surrounding properties which is why we're pursuing a unconditional rezoning if no one else has conditions we shouldn't have them either with that we said you know what's the best use for it so that we have some flexibility 
And the suggestion came from Mr. Woody to do that, and from Tammy as well, and said, well, let's go with the MXR. And there was some correspondence back and forth for those reasons as well. And one of the things I also want to provide to you is some of that correspondence from Mr. Woody. It's in their packets. I can tell you what page it is. Well, I have that. I don't have a ton of copies, but I've got some of the emails on some of that stuff. Thank you. I'll get back to the microphone. But some of the requests came with this, you know, from Tammy to Ben, because some of the discussions when I started work, I'd usually start with Ben, and then we talk about who on staff would represent staff and, and be, you know, the partner to work with on the project. And we said, you know, what can we do? So Tammy's message to Ben was, you know, <coughs> I'm showing, no offense to Tammy, her words, stupidity here, but why MXR? Could there be an issue with spot zoning since it's only an acre? I realize spot zoning is not always a legal issue. I think we'd have a better case for extending the GB business that it joins the back of the property. Ben elaborates and says, since MXR allows a range of business uses similar to GB, I think it's okay. A few reasons. They, being my wife and I, don't want to pursue a conditional rezoning. MXR doesn't allow as many potentially incompatible uses. And I'll address that as well in the packet because from a staff perspective now, we're showing a lot of incompatible uses. But if you compare that to the GB, which is feet away from this property, it can do all the things that MXR can do and some additional. But I'd like to get to that in a moment. I just want to put that in your, your mind to think about. The MXR is intended to be more of a neighborhood serving district. This parcel fits the description since it's off the highway within walking distance of schools and houses. We have a big neighborhood over next door at Lakeview. Ryan Homes is developing. We have Eagle Creek with 400-some homes. We have a school within walking distance. All those kind of things fall into that category as well. And they also, he says, they also mentioned subdividing the parcel and converting to residential if the business idea flops. I think MXR makes this possible without another rezoning. When we do things, we typically don't try to redo things. We try to do them once, but we need some flexibility. Like I told you, if my wife's bakery doesn't work out, I need to be able to do something else with the property. I don't need to put a couple hundred thousand dollars into it and then go, okay, now what do we do with it? And then we come before and we talk about this and do these things again. So that's the reason why we pursued MXR. We didn't do it blindly, and we did it with a recommendation of staff in the beginning. Now, since then, some of that has turned 180 degrees, and I'm not sure exactly why, but I'd like to go through some of the, the comments that were review, reviewed and give you some of Mark and I's perspective as well. When we take a look at the incompatible uses that are listed on page 2 of 7 in the report, if you see that there, it starts out with allowed conventional MXR that are not allowed in conventional ag. Table 4.1.1. Page 7 in your packets. Thank you, Tammy. The highlighted categories are the ones I'm going to focus on. Dormitory. Dormitory is allowed in GB, which again is literally feet, a baseball throw, underhand from this property. You could do a dormitory. And that's all, again, con unconditional GB, meaning that you can do a dormitory right behind this property. But this property, not permissible. We, we think it's incompatible because it's MXR. A cultural facility, that's okay in SFM. So is a library, so is a museum. So SFM, MXR, SFO, GB, you can do those anywhere. I, I don't see how any of those cause disturbances in the community. Again, if we, if we zone this MXR, I'm not seeing how that creates an issue. A senior center. Now I know the over 65 crowd can get out of control and rowdy sometimes. Miss Carroll, you kind of... Hey. Probably got a wild hair there too, but I struggle with the seniors being an issue if we were going to do a senior center there. That's not our intention. Youth club facility, again, can be done in GB. No special use permits, none of this stuff. And I've labeled all these in here as well where you see my handwriting. Adult daycare, GB. Child care center, allowed in SFM, so across the street in Eagle Creek, on this property, all those can be done. High school, 
If you reference 4.1.2 table and take a look at that, we currently have our, our middle school in ag. Now, you can do a middle school in ag, but you actually have to have a use permit. But if you do MXR, you don't have to. And if you do GB, you don't have to either. And that's, again, right from our UDO2, if you take those tables and take a look at it. It's on the second page of table 4.1.2. If it's got a U next to it, you need a use permit. If it's got a Z, you're ready to go. Restaurant, indoor, outdoor seating. Yes, you can do that in MXR, but you have to have a special use permit, which means we have to go before a board or have a review to even do that, if we even wanted to do that. Business and sales office, again, okay in GB. Fitness center, okay in GB. Indoor recreation, okay in GB. Theater, okay in GB. Athletic facility, okay in SFM. GB, MXR, all those things. Golf course. Well, we got one acre. I'm pretty sure we're not going to do a golf course. Maybe mini golf, but golf course, not a chance. Even at that, you're, you know, we can do that in SFM, and O, SFI, MXR, GB, but they all have a use permit requirement. Golf course driving range. Again, we got one acre. We better be doing just chipping, no driving out there. But you can do that in GB right behind it. Outdoor recreation, GB. MXR requires use permit. Convenience store, GB. MXR. Drug store, GB. MXR. GB, MXR. All the way the rest of the way down. Bed and breakfast. You can do it in SFM as well. My point to this is literally an underarm baseball throw behind this. You can do all these things. So if all these things are incompatible uses that create havoc with the neighborhood and the area we're talking about, why can you do them feet away? The next point, if we go to the next page, um, and this is talking about the five factors where we talk about little emphasis on the property owners. The ag property adjoining is 30,000 SFM lots. The ag property adjoining is, we're talking about nine acres if we add up all the, pro all the parcels that actually touch it, 9.6 acres. And it's sitting there on an island right in the middle of GB, SFM, and this property. So it's not a, a huge tract of property we're talking about. If you go across the street, jump over the SFM at Lakeview, yeah, there's more ag there, but it doesn't touch the property except at that one point. And we have a road in between. As far as the, the property size and the lot sizes being small, currently in Lakeview, there are 8,000, 9,000 square foot lots. I pulled one up just for an illustrative example, if we need to have, if anybody's questioning that, but it was 0.21 acres, which is 9,135 square feet. Much smaller than what we could even do on this property if we tried to maximize it and slice it and dice it as tight as we could get it at 15,000 square foot lots. Yes, there's no open space, but if we did a subdivision like we do on Tallest Creek Road, there's a four lot subdivision that Wilson is doing down there and they cut that up and there's no open space on that because it's a small subdivision. That's not my intent. My intent is most likely on the bakery route, but they have a backup if we need to do something else and I'm a home builder and if I need to do that, I'll build something there to get my money out of the property. That's why, again why we're pursuing MXR. As far as taking a look at the, um, the balance with compatibility and opt adaptability, yes, the nearest property is 2.5 miles away up in Shingle Landing. That's also next to GB and has SFM not very far from it as well. So again, same kind of proximity, same kind of stuff going on there. And we spent a lot of money with a company called Kimley Horn. We spent $100,000 with them. And then we liked the work they did so much, we spent another $150,000 as a county as well. And the reason I know that is I'm the chairman for the Economic Development Board for this county. And we took a look at those things. And the densities that they put in there and recommend for what we're doing in this area, saying that this is too dense, are two and three times what we currently do in our UDO. Those people clearly have a, a strong education background. They see a lot of things. They understand a lot of those pieces and those values. And they come with intelligence. And clearly, we believe and trust them enough that we spent a quarter of a million dollars with them to find that out. Now, as far as relationships and uses of these things, I want to turn your attention to another P 
piece I've put together for you. Um, let's see if I've got enough copies. I think I've just got one copy with me. But if you take a look at, everybody familiar with Kilmarlick? Okay, in Kilmarlick, there's four acres of MXR there that butts up to 199 acres of SFM. Almost exactly the same proportions we're talking about here. 50 to 1. So we're doing the same ratios, we're doing the same things, we're doing them in a different area. We're doing them less than what the maximums are. We're trying to stay in accordance with all these different things as well. When we get into some of the other details in this relative to uses, we're talking about that it's incompatible and we think that we're going to have, would it create any, any is staff's opinion that the rezoning will conflict with the public interest and is not in harmony with the purpose or intent of this ordinance? There's two pieces of data I'd like you to think about when you, when you read that point. One is tonight, we're here at 7 o'clock. This has been on the agenda. It's been published. This is all public meeting. There's not a single person from the community that showed up to this meeting. Not for or against this. The same exact thing happened when we posted the signs. Notice rezoning. We had our community meeting. Tammy and I sat there for 30 minutes and looked at each other across the end of the table. We talked about kids and ice cream and what kind of things my wife makes at the home bakery. Again, Nobody showed up. So as far as it being a community saying we don't want it or this is not the right place for it, no one's shown up on two occasions to voice any concern about this. They haven't written any emails. They haven't showed up. So I'm struggling with where the conflict is in that piece. <coughs> as far as facilities go, we've also talked to the county manager. We talked to Dan Scanlon, and we've asked permission for the sewer capacity. He's granted us that as well. So he said, yeah, go through with your rezoning. You get your rezoning, everything done. You can have your capacity, not a problem. So we have the, the county manager's support from that perspective. As far as the other issues in here that we're talking about from a spot zoning perspective, we're really just struggling to see them. And I think Mark did a good job presenting and talking about those elements in how we're to, we just completely disagree with the conflict on this. And I don't know how we've ended up 180 degrees apart at this point, but when we started this, we had staff support for this, and somewhere in some transition, we've seen some changes of that. Yeah, that'd be great. <coughs> Good evening, I'm Mark Bissell. I mainly wanted to elaborate on the um, the report that I did, the October 24th, which you have in your packets, uh, talking about whether or not this could be considered a legal spot zoning. Uh, Tammy went through the five criteria for what can, what could be considered spot zoning. Four of those five, if they our problem could make it considered a legal spot zoning. So I've addressed those four in this report. The first being the size of the track. It's on page, I'm sorry, Mark. It's on page 20 of your packets. And if you look at this track, about 90% of the land around it, consi consisting of 10 parcels and 230 acres, is already zoned GB. And GB allows a higher and more intensive, intensive development than you can do in MXR. It allows, as Sam uh, outlined, a lot of uses that MXR doesn't allow. M MXR is really intended for smaller neighborhood kinds of commercial uses. So based on the fact that most of the land around here allows for a, a higher intensity of use than MXR allows, it would be almost impossible to make a case for it being a legal spot zoning based on the size of the tract. And that is because, you know, and the, you all are probably familiar with Dave Owens, who is really the, the zoning guru with the, the Institute of Government. And um, Dave cites a case called McAfee versus Forsyth County. 
and he says the the main issue is not so much the size of the parcel, but the size of the tract that's being rezoned with respect to, and I quote here, the vast majority of the land immediately around it. So if you compare this rezoning to the vast majority of the land around it, we're asking for a rezoning that would allow a less intensive use than the vast majority of the land around it. Based on that, it would be very difficult to make a case that this is a legal spot zoning based on the size of the track. The second one, compatibility with existing comprehensive plans. And I know Tammy went through that and said that it, it's consistent with a small area plan. Uh, question whether it's consistent with the land use plan. We submit that it actually is because it, uh, the land use plan considers this full service Full service areas are defined as areas preferred for community centers, including those parts of the county where a broad range of infrastructure and service investments have been provided, which they have in this location, or will be made available by the public and or private sectors, which may include central wastewater treatment and disposal, which is present and has been offered to the track. And with respect to the residential development, and this is in the low to mid range of what the land use plan allows in full service if he, if he chooses to go to the residential route. Uh, likewise, the, uh, as Tammy indicated, the Moyoc small area plan also designates this as full service and uh, calls for you know, two to four units per acre. But um, the uses that would be permitted in the MXR zoning are at the lower end, at the lower end of the in intensity of the uses that are allowed on 90% of the surrounding property. So based on that uh, and uh, based on the fact that, uh, it, that it appears to be consistent with both the land use plan and the Moyoc small area plan, it would be virtually impossible to say it's a legal spot zoning on the basis of not being compatible with existing comprehensive plans. So that's point number two. Point number three is balancing benefits and detriments. Yes, the landowner will certainly benefit from the rezoning, but so will the community at large. You know, this, this neighborhood is changing, it's evolving, it's becoming it's becoming a neighborhood. It has two major developments there. It has a school. The area is going to evolve into neighborhood businesses that will support those communities. So, so we see this as a benefit to not just the landowner, but to the community, to the neighborhood and the community at large. When we do the surveys and we talk with things through my wife and through our existing business. One of the first questions is, when is your hard location going to go up? When are you going to have a storefront that we can go to and actually buy the product rather than ordering online or calling you for an order? When are we going to have something we could go into? So we do get this. We've got no comment that ever said, oh, a bakery? Don't put that in Moyak. We don't want that here. So the analysis of who may be harmed by a rezoning must consider whether the treating of this property differently than it's treated right now would change the character of the existing neighborhood in a way that would harm the neighbors as a result. We see it as a benefit, not a harm. And then the last one is the relationship of the uses. If there is a great disparity in the relationship between the current uses and the proposed uses, in the area, then it could be considered a legal spot zoning. And the greater the disparity, the more likely the zoning would be held illegal. And that was the point where we spent <clears throat> a lot of time talking about you can do a dormitory in GB. You can also go do a bed and breakfast there. You can do daycare in an SFM. All the things that surround it that we're concerned about the usage in the staff report, you can do in these adjacent properties. So it's okay to do it here, but not here. 
The Institute of Government says that the rezoning also needs to take into consideration the way that the character of an area is changing or evolving. And since the Survey Road um, area has been changing and evolving for a number of years, including having sewer available, including having these smaller lot developments uh, developed and, and built out, um, there's just going to be further neighborhood type development along this corridor that will support these developments. So we don't see how this could dramatically disturb the existing neighborhood over there. So I think it would be very difficult to categorize this as illegal spot zoning on the basis of the relationships of these uses. They're all, they all appear to be compatible. We really think that the recommendations that the staff offered on page five of the staff report, where they said if the board finds the applicant's request is valid, that the following statement of consistency and reasonableness, we think this is right on target. It is consistent with the 2006 land use plan, including policies HN3 and CD1 regarding mixed use developments and uh, neighborhood serving commercial districts. It's consistent with the following policies in the Moyoc Small Area Plan, policy IS1 and ST1, where we're trying to foster a small town Main Street feel. And it's a reasonable request with the existing and proposed uses surrounding the land subject to this application and is the appropriate zoning district and land use for the area because MXR does not allow many potentially incompatible uses. MXR is intended to be a neighborhood serving district and this parcel fits that description since it is off the highway and within walking distance of the schools and houses. We think the staff is right on target with, with that closing. If the board agrees that this is a reasonable request, is not illegal spot zoning, I think you have plenty of, uh, yeah, I think you have everything you need here to make that finding. I'm glad to answer any questions. Last thing I give you as well is one more document. This shows you Kilmarlock in the printout. I don't have five of them, but I'll give you all five so you can take a look at them. Shows a very, very similar picture of what we're proposing. So I'll probably ask you to, to share if, we, if you will. I, I, I got one color one that one. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. You're welcome. So are you talking about the conditional MXR where the cottages are? Up front. Um, <coughs> you see the sheet, so I can. I believe it is. It is. Okay. Yeah, there's some conditional. There's also some standard as well. There's both actually there. Is that the little thing right on the highway that they're going to do the cottages? Mm -hmm. yeah. Little cottages are doing now. Mm -hmm. There's also some non-conditional right there as well, too, just north of that, as you see on that map. Yeah. Okay. So I gave Carol the color copy when I ran it through the copier. I apologize I didn't get color for everybody. All righty. Um, now it's time for questions or whatever from the board. Well, I'd like to begin by not, it's not a question, it's a statement. I think my problem with this whole thing is the fact that it's a conventional rezone and not a conditional because that limit, or it doesn't limit, it takes away our opportunity or the commissioner's opportunity to know exactly what's going on that property. I understand. And that kind of bothers me. I live in Moyoc. Mm -hmm. So do I. And, you know, you could decide, hey, I got a one-acre lot here. I'm going to build a strip joint. Actually, I can't. That's only an HI. Yeah. Well. <laughs> so if we want to take a look at that. But what bothers me, sir, is that... You would be free to do anything you wanted to with that property. Within the MXR zoning. Well, that sounds like a lot. 
Well, I have the sheet if you'd like to take a look at it. You can see everything. I, well, I, I've, I've got an, I know what that is, but it's just, um, if it was a conditional rezoning, I think maybe I could be a little more open-minded about it, but this conventional thing bothers me. Well, which, which uh, items within the MXR categories that you're allowed to do bother you? Not anything specific, sir. It's just that I think that it's important to be able to know, is it a bakery? Is it going to be a bakery from now and forever? Or are you going to put residential places on it? Well, it, it won't be forever. We all know that nothing's forever. None of us are forever well, in this yeah, world. That, that's my question, too, because, I mean, you came out and said 85 percent fails right so you're telling us right now i mean it's going to probably fail when you're going to put six houses six units there no first of all there's other things that have to be met before you're allowed to put six units there okay but it can be done theoretically it could be done we don't know if the soils will support it we don't know based on the coverages and the sizes we do whether or not we're going to fall into coverage ratios based on the sizes and the footprints and how much impervious area we put down what the stormwater plans are going to do if we exceed our 24 percent coverage ratios we don't know any of that we haven't done any of that i haven't gone to even think about that saying that we're just able to put six houses on there doesn't really tell the whole story you know that tells a part of the story what i am asking for the reason is to not be conditional is no one else is restricted my neighbors aren't so because of that we're going to punish or segregate myself because i want to do something but somebody else who's already zoned something right next door to me can do whatever they want in a higher zoning district. It's kind of an apples and oranges comparison because you went into this with eyes open and bought that parcel. Mm -hmm. So sure. you inflicted this on yourself. I understand. You know, so there, it's a little bit different there. And when I look down this list, I have to say that on a one-acre track, there's only a handful of items that you could shoehorn into that track. Sure. Um, if the bakery is such a great idea, and I got nothing against it, then uh, a uh, carryover of the GB district would not be a difficult sell. All of the things that I've heard, I think, are legitimate concerns of mine as well. But what I haven't heard is the precedent. And if we do this, what's the next one acre plot and the next one acre plot and the next all the way down that's that's not my vision for the corridor pick and choose i want to do this i want to do that raise your hand and you got it right that's that's not planning huh. i have two other c comments number one you didn't bring us anything from the bakery <laughs> So we don't know if we even want a bakery in Million. Well, I don't know what your outcome is going to be. I don't know if I want to bring you anything or not. <laughs> and the other comment you made was you referred to me as being more than 65 and being a wild woman. <laughs> Number one, one of them is true and one of them is not. I'll just let you decide. <laughs> I stand corrected and apologize. Uh, Duly noted, you. please. Y'all go ahead and continue with your questions, please. Now, one thing I would like to mentioned to you Ms. Bell and um, Mr. McCauley. 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 Thank you. I'm not opposed to putting some condition on this in MXR, but I want flexibility, just the same as you would with your property. Don't you think you have flexibility with GB? I do and I, mean, I you don't. Can, you you, you well, can put a lawyer's suite up in the general business, business district, yeah. right? You know, but I mean, hear me out, please. Okay. You know, I can, okay? But how many lawyer suites do we need? And how much GB is currently available? One of the arguments that this board sees a lot of times is everybody rezones everything to GB, and then nobody does anything with it, and it just sits there. Why do we keep rezoning this stuff if nobody's going to do anything with it? Well, GB doesn't provide a bridge flexibility in that area. Yeah, I could see something where a small restaurant, a small town restaurant would fit there. I could see where a bakery would fit there. I could see, you know, where maybe some insurance sales, you know, office or something like that could go next to a bakery. You could do a couple things like that in there. But just to make a GB and restrict it that way, if none of that stuff worked out and nobody wanted to do anything with it because they all want to be on the highway, then really I'm sitting next to a community in a school. And I need to have some flexibility where if I do need to build a house, I can build a house and sell it because I know I can build a house and sell a house there.
And that's really why it went that way. I said that to Ben when we talked about it. I said, Ben, I said, I need some flexibility in something with the property. If it doesn't work out, then I need to be able to do something else with it. I don't think anybody here would have a problem with you building a house. But I, I, I don't think there's any guarantee or there's any indication that it will end up being a house, a single-family dwelling. I think you think that I have some ulterior motives with it. Uh, no, there's an unknown on our part. Well, same on mine as well. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and all I'm saying is if everybody else is not restricted, why should this parcel be restricted? Once again, you went into this with eyes open, you know, so you restricted yourself. We didn't do it. That's fair. I have a question for you. You said yeah. you spoke with Dan about uh, sewer capacity over there. Yeah. Was there any discussion about capacity for how many dwellings? We talked about two units. Two and units. And basically, because I could subdivide this into two pieces was the plan. <coughs> and I'm working with somebody right now. We're doing a project in the Outer Banks. We're building a restaurant for uh, a company in the Outer Banks right now. Um, their business is somewhat private. It's not a strip club, by the way. But, uh, and, uh, but, uh, Long story short, we're doing some of that, and they had talked about expressing some interest where they may want to do something more in the Moyoc area. Mm -hmm. And my perspective, I mean, I'm a contractor and a developer, but I'm really an investor, so I look at it from a numbers perspective. And I said to my wife, I said, well, you know, if we had two lots, I could maybe sell one and get some of your money out of this where your debt ratio works, where you could actually make money and sustain the bakery. Because the bricks are just expensive, and that's the short of it. Oh, I understand. So the plan was for two units, and that's an email as well. I could provide you that, or Dan could provide it to you. So that's that's a, a true statement. Well, I know the concern I have is, is as you So, I mean, if I did houses, the worst it would be would be two houses at that point. Would you be willing to self-impose a restriction on yourself to two houses? If we did houses? Yes. Are there any other restrictions on here from MXR if I wanted to do something else that you'd want to put on there? We can't put restrictions on a convention. We wouldn't rezoning. be putting it. He would he would be doing it willingly. You can't do that with a straight rezoning. That would require, con, um, I'm sorry, conditional rezoning. I think what we're talking about, Tammy, is that maybe the board and, and I would agree to go conditional with certain conditions at that point, if that would make sense for everybody. I don't, I don't think that you can do that with a conventional rezoning. To place conditions by either party, it would be a conditional rezoning. I think that's what we're agreeing to maybe do, okay. if that's okay. Could they do that? Could he decide tonight to change it from conventional to conditional, just word of mouth kind of thing, or is, is, should that? Be a well, we have public record. Wouldn't it? That would be a resubmission. I, I was wondering if that would have to be redone and come back before us with the redones. He would have to resubmit As a to change to a conditional. Right. To Well, as a resident of Moyoc, I personally prefer business. Mm -hmm. That's something we don't have a lot of. You know, we don't have a lot of nice hometown restaurants or even a, a bakery. We have lots of houses, and we have lots more coming. And, you know, people are constantly saying, why can't we get some business in Moyoc so people can find a a way to make a living here instead of having to go to Virginia. Mm -hmm. So I, pers that's another personal comment. But um, And I'd be happy to talk with you about that offline <clears throat> if you want to, but it's probably not something for this forum. Well, like if, in my personal opinion, the if, it, if you were just going to say, okay, I'm going to do this bakery and that's it, it might be a lot more agreeable than just doing this conventional rezoning and Lord only knows what would happen. It could happen with any of those things that you listed. I, I hear you, Ms. Bell, and I live here too. And my daughter goes to school there, and my other daughter will go to school there, and my son will go to school there because they're younger right now in elementary schools. And I don't have intentions of doing those things. When I started doing work in this community, I moved here, and I started doing that stuff as well. I don't want to destroy the community. That's not what it is. I'm not some guy who's from out of state who's just coming down, and this is what I want to do here, and, and I want to – cut the wheat from the fields and leave the chaff and, and run down the road. I've made my home here. I've spent a lot of time here. We try to do a lot of the things right. I got involved in the county government. I got appointed to the Economic Development Board. I got nominated by my peers to be the chairman of that board. 
I've sided with the commissioners and stood with them on decisions that were hard decisions sometimes relative to personnel and other things relative to that board. And I've tried to do the right thing. I'm not perfect. I give my wife's number. You can call her. She'll tell you all about it. But the short of it is I do try to make it right and I try to do the right thing. And I'm just trying to be open and honest with you and tell you that, look, this is my plan, but I need to have some backup. So that someday when I come before you for something else, you don't say, oh, are you going to change the cards on me? Are you going to tell me one thing and then do something else? I'm trying to just be honest with you and say, look, this is the business conditions we live in. This is the nature of the economy. And I'd love to have somewhere to go to eat. But until we start doing some things like that, it's going to be tough. You know, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate your honesty. But I, I hope you can appreciate my position of opening that can of worms on that corridor and setting that precedent. We have it in the zoning pieces. At, at some point, we'll have to use it, you know. That's, that's the only thing, you know, and, and it will come someday. It's not necessarily a precedent. It's a question of when do you do it or not. I mean, until, on a, until on a we one acre it. Trot, on a one-acre plot, I would have to say uh, uh, seldom, if ever. It's, it, it, it's just going to stand out like a sore thumb. That's what planning is all about, to make sure everything blends together in a cohesive manner. And when you have one acre next to 60, but it's also a stair step. If you look across the street, you have SFM. So you want to go from unconditional general business, cross the street, and you step into single family. In, in, in this case, but maybe not the next or the next or the next. Well, because those, we're, are, those are valid points, I think, to consider in the next case or the next case. You know, is it really a stair step? Or are you putting two incompatible zoning districts next to each other? I'm open to if, you, if there's things on here that you say, look, this is something that we really think, even though it's an MXR, shouldn't be there. Tell me what they are. But I'm a specifics guy. I, I don't like the only generalities. Well, for me, it's the density. I mean, being, being able to, to, to construct six separate uh, dwellings there uh, and, and be, in, be in the conditions met, I just uh, I have a problem with that. Okay. So multifamily. We could eliminate multifamily from it. That's what you're going to have to do to do that. But we can't, not without a resubmission. I understand, but we might as well get something done tonight. I don't want to go through and have all this discussion and dialogue and then do this again next time. Let's get it done. Let's stack hands and agree. And you, I'll give you my word that I'll come forward with what I'll tell you I'll come forward with, but I expect that all of you come forward and support me as well, if that's fair. That seems fair to me. That, that is fair, but just a few minutes ago you cited – the, the change that happened in the past six months. I did, yes. Okay. Two months from now, there's going to be different people sitting here. Right. Well, I'm going to resubmit, and we're going to be here next month. Can that happen, Tim? If you can. I don't have the I'm just saying that, you know, you may not be dealing with the people you see sitting in front of you. Right. Like you're not dealing with Ben Woody. I understand. Laundromat would be nice. The specifics, specifics of density are really the only problem that I have personally. Okay. So if we eliminated multifamily category there, yeah, that's the only issue you have, Mr. O'Brien? Personally, yes. Mr. Thomas, any issues from your perspective other than what's already stated? Well, definitely in multifamily. Um, I mean, I'm looking at two lots. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to subdivide it in two pieces. It, anything more than that would require a special use permit, right? That I'm not that aware of. They can get one more lot as a minor subdivision, and then it would kick it into major sub with the use permit. I mean, theoretically, you could do three, but it's pie shaped. The last piece is going to be so screwed up that right, it, it's not going to make sense. But so, it could be done. Yes, I guess it could be done. Straight math, it, it could be done. Straight math, but he would have to do some site assessment. To whether it would be truly feasible the straight numbers yeah but three and not six right to go more than two possibly three he would have to submit major site plans and require special permits from the commissioners but the accessory structures you were speaking of Th that's correct um it would be three lots if they do sustainable development practices but he could in, in any let me just not, 
you know, any single family uh, dwelling could have a an accessory dwelling up to a thousand square feet. So that's not just uh, Mr. Miller's project, but any single family home. Like what, Ms. Bell? What neighborhood do you live in, or do you live in a neighborhood? Now, does anyone live in a neighborhood? Anyone here? Yeah, I do. What neighborhood do you live in? Carolina Club. Okay, and in Carolina Club, you know, I don't know what the HOA says, but other than permissibility from the HOA, if somebody in your neighborhood want to build an accessory dwelling unit up to a thousand square feet. Not going to happen. The set books, they could do it. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, no, it, 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 county might say so, but it's not going to happen. Yeah, uh, it, it yeah. depends on the HOA. Right, exactly. But, but long story short, you know, if you wanted to do that in Laurel Woods Estates, that's the subdivision we built. You'd be permissible to do that. You could put an accessory dwelling unit in there. The county doesn't restrict it, and the HOA doesn't restrict it. I believe Eagle Creek would probably be the same thing. You know, there's there's other subdivisions that you can do that in. So, it, you could do that anywhere you want today that there's a house, basically. I see two lots and the third one probably not meeting the setbacks. I see it being a struggle. If I wanted to force it, yeah, but I just don't see it working well. I mean, I don't have an issue eliminating multifamily. Is there anything else that you want to eliminate? Uh, density was my big issue, but I, I, I will reiterate that that I have a precedent setting concern overall. But just to clarify, if we approved it as it's presented tonight, he can only get three lots there. He could potentially get three lots. With three accessory structures. It could have three accessory structures as well. Meaning a six place. Uh, a, a live in suite kind of thing is that what you're right, speaking you of build, a lot of folks are building they call them granny flats they're like a thousand square feet single mother-in-law suite type thing yeah. right. mm -hmm. garage apartments would fall into that same category yeah. i personally don't have a problem with the way it's presented because i think he's going to have to require a lot more permits to get more than two houses in there or a bakery Any more questions? Thank you, sir. No. Okay. Is there anyone else to speak to this issue? Okay. So the public hearing is closed. Okay, board members. Now it's your turn to uh, time to make a motion. As presented, I make a motion we deny. May you, would you state some? Yeah, I can, I can uh, go down the litany at this point. Uh, I, 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 it is uh, in conflict with the general statute of regulations regarding legal spot zoning. It's in conflict, conflict with the land use plan, HN1. It is, uh, does not address the demonstrated community need. It's not an appropriate zoning district for the uses of land, and it adversely impacts neighboring lands. We have a motion. Do I hear a second? I have a second. All right. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, like sign. Aye. I'm opposed. Okay, so I see it. It's three that approve and two that oppose motion carried okay next item is PB 17-07 Ponderosa Enterprises Incorporated request for zoning map amendment to rezone approximately 12 acres from AG to GB conventional zoning district of property located on shortcut road Adjacent to Ponderosa Mobile Home Park, tax map 52, parcel 22A, Crawford Township. Ms. Voliva, please. Thank you, Madam Chairman. This request submitted to us by Ponderosa Enterprises is located on Shortcut Road. The property consists of about 42 acres, slightly under. Um, 
in its entirety and it contains a split zoning district and multiple uses. Right now the property consists of the Ponderosa Mobile Home Park, which is identified in this area where you see the, the roads. There's also a self-storage facility on the property and then there's pasture lands that make up the area of the request. As I mentioned, the property cont currently contains two zoning districts. There is GB in the developed area and agricultural in the pasture lands. This is directly across the street from the county complex, the campus setting that houses the airport, the COA building, the YMCA, the um, Cooperative Extension, and the uh, Commerce Center that is located in the back that's currently undeveloped, and the transfer facility. Let me go back one more time and just show you the surrounding zoning districts as they exist today. Um, the property across the street is zone general business and heavy industrial. Located to the south is heavy industrial and some agricultural. To the east is agricultural. Also, this property is located in the um, airport overlay zone. The airport overlay zone consists of three compatible use areas. There's compatible use zone one, two, and three. This property actually falls in all three of them. Uh, compatible zone one is the area that's shown, and I apologize for the, the, um, the actual map. It's not real clear. But this area in here which is the runway, you can, you can see it in the lighter area right there. Uh, this is compatible zone one. That is significantly restricted in the occupancy of the lands that are located in that area. It limits it to a 10 person occupancy for the use that's proposed on that property. You, it currently allows for single family detached dwellings, aviation related uses, non-residential uses and uses that, as I mentioned, do not exceed an occupancy of 10 people per acre or conservation area. It takes into account this small corner of the property, which is the triangular corner on the western edge, as well as an area here. The majority of the property is in compatible zone two. That limits an occupancy of 40 people per acre so it significantly increases. And as you get out to the area that's currently zoned general business, that um, is, basic, is based on the base zoning district in terms of the allowable uses. So just to point out, even if the rezoning is approved, the airport overlay will continue on this property. There's no proposed change for that, and it will be limited to the ordinance requirements for that. This property is also located in the Maple Barco Small Area Plan. It is identified as an employment area. It is also located in a full service area identified in the 2006 land use plan. Um, what I'd like to point out at this point is go over with you the um, proposed request as well as the issues related to the land use plan and the small area plan that was later developed for the boundaries that are shown on this map that are the colored areas. So as I mentioned, the property is requ the, the request for this property is to rezone from agricultural to general business. This is a conventional rezoning requests, meaning that there are no conditions being proposed on this property. Um, it is an extension to an existing general business district that exists on this property. Currently, about two-thirds of the property is zoned general business, so the request will be to rezone the remaining acreage unconditioned. 
So the Maple Barco small area plan deals with some um, issues as it relates to the actual use or the land use cat classification for this property, which is shown as the employment area. What that basically states in, in, the, um, in the small area plan is it suggests usage, uses should be encouraged to develop in a campus-like setting with generous linked open space to maximize the value, promote visual quality, and to ensure pedestrian activity between the employment areas and other supporting uses. So in general, this request, it's in a full service area, it's in an employment area, so you would think that general business would be consistent. And, and generally speaking, it would be. It would support um, the employment center and the full service area. However, in both plans, both the land use plan and the Maple Barco small area plan, there are policies that are outlined in there that deal with compatibility, which is a concern staff has. So although generally speaking we feel like it's no direct conflict with, with either of the plans, there are, it's difficult to determine whether or not it's consistent. And policies that would um, directly relate to the development of the site or compatibility uh, would be land use plan policy CD2, CD4, CD9, ED1, ED4. And policies within the Moyoc, uh, or excuse me, the Maple Barco small area plan that relate specifically to development plans and site design are land use 9 and TR4. I'm not going to go over what they actually say. Um, They're provided to you. So without a plan that would show some development patterns on this property, we feel like there's some inconsistencies. The county has made a significant investment in the central portion of this small area plan area. And um, Mr. Sawyer will probably elaborate a little bit more on what he proposes to do or what he would like to do with the property. But there are concerns with how that property directly across from the county's um, investment would be developed in making sure it's compatible. Um, so far as the review standards are concerned, there are 11 items that are listed in the ordinance that need to be addressed to determine whether or not a property should be rezoned. I won't go over each one of them, but I will point out the ones that staff feels are, are some areas of concern for compatibility. Um, as I mentioned, the request does not include adequate information to determine compliance with the Maple Barco small area plan. Those policies are outlined um, in your packet. And um, how I do want to point out that there are there is the ability to address some of these through site plan design. There's no way to guarantee that that can happen through a conventional zoning request, as you just heard earlier tonight. Um, conventional rezonings cannot have conditions. So even though there, um, Mr. Sawyer could say, I, want, I, I will guarantee you that we will not do certain uses or we will do um, certain things to the site in terms of site uh, signage, pedestrian circulation, there's no guarantee or no assurances that that would truly be done. Uh, one other item that we're concerned with is that it will, it, without compatibility being adequately addressed, there's concern for logical and orderly development patterns and compatibility between the, the current land uses and um, the proposed Maple Barco small area plan. As far as staff recommendation is concerned, we do believe, as I mentioned, that it is generally supportive uh, to the 2006 land use plan and the Maple Barco small area plan for this property to be zoned general business. However, both plans further describe the business generating uses compatible through site design that will prevent the strip development and incorporate access controls, pedestrian circulation, signage buffers and the scale of the development 
we would like to work more closely with the applicant to try to come up with a plan that could be provided to the planning board and ultimately to the board of commissioners that could incorporate some conditional zoning. Uh, however, that does require the applicant's support in order to do that. We do understand uh, Mr. Sawyer's ability and needs to market the property for general business. Uh, we'd like to try to incorporate maybe some redevelopment in, in those discussions um, with his support. However, that will take time. Um, so at this point, we, I don't want to say a recommendation of denial. We would like to try to work towards a conditional zoning application if Mr. Sawyer is agreeable to that and maybe come forward to the board with uh, some alternate plans that are somewhat generic but could address some of the compatibility issues that staff has. And with that, I will be happy to answer any questions or um, have further discussions with Mr. Sawyer. Would he have to reapply? Like the he he would he would it would be a new application and it would he would submit a plan, um, as generic as possible to try to work on some access controls, some signage, buffers. Um, avoidance of some of the strip development concerns that are provided in the small area plan right that would develop a campus style project and maybe some redevelopment of the property I would like to know why is it just a county thing or is it a state thing that there is such a thing as a conventional rezone Conventional rezoning has historically been the only tool available um, that for someone to rezone a piece of property. You could not put conditions or contract with landowners um, to rezone their property because it was considered illegal. So the state of North Carolina instituted the allowance of conditional zoning or conditional use zoning that allowed for communities to work with an applicant where the applicant proposed those conditions. It wasn't something that the county did. The applicant would propose the conditions. The board would review them for consistency with their land use plans and other plans adopted, counties and cities. And it allowed for negotiations and project design to be worked out as part of the rezoning request where the two parties agreed and County agreed we would rezone your property, provided you are doing what you say you're doing or excluding certain uses from your request. So that's, that's I don't know if it's relatively, I mean, it's not really a new thing. It's been around for some time. Um, and the county has historically, in the past probably eight to ten years, has it done conditional rezoning request? I mean, um, conditional rezoning request. Prior to that, they were conventional. Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Voliva? Might even be longer than that. I can't really remember. <laughs> okay. It's been a long time. <laughs> uh, would the applicant please come up, state your name and address, please? Yes, my name is David Sawyer, live at 127 His Way in uh, Barco, North Carolina. And uh, one question I had, Donna, was uh, Camden, Pass Plank, Clemens, do they do a lot of the uh, conditional rezoning, or do you think they do I most of the I have to check into that. I'm not sure. I'm sure they, right. most communities do have that as a tool for a zoning change. Right. So that's, uh, zoning the, that's map kind of amendment. the new trend instead of the. In eastern North Carolina, it probably is. Right. Northeastern North Carolina, it's it's not a tool that's been used um, for a long time where it has been in other parts of the state. I guess the, the situation came up as to whether we were going to do a conditional or conventional. Um, and the question really came about because uh, it's kind of like having an arranged marriage. <laughs> and, and we... Um, we just don't think that we should take and have to be forced into saying what our options are 
we've owned the property since 1973, I think, and um, and so we've uh, we've chose to kind of leave it rural, and everything else has come to us uh, while we've been there. I actually live in the the property that's uh, outlined in this, so um, I get to watch the Learjets come in. It doesn't bother us at all, but um, at the same time, we didn't want to get locked into saying what we're going to have to do because we really don't know what we're going to do. We'd like to leave our options open as to hearing from people that would be interested in partnering with us in the development of it, which certainly would involve the county being involved with it. Um, me being on the property, us owning the property, it's something that we wouldn't want to do something negative. And I think it kind of gets down to the question of uh, where is the trust of a citizen in the local government? And... Um, and how that we use our land. And so that's kind of the, the way we came about requesting this, is, uh, is the fact that we feel like it's time to really conform to what's around us. You know, oftentimes it's the exact opposite, that you're being asked to, to take and uh, change things, you know, from agriculture to, to a business because it needs to be in that area. But here we are, you know, 12 acres of agriculture, we're not going to make a living off of the 12 acres of agriculture. Um, I hate the fact that uh, people are going to miss our cows possibly one day. It would probably be after I'm gone because we really don't have that much uh, perspective as to what we're going to do in the property right now. But we feel like now is the time for us to go ahead and get it uh, zoned. It's only going to become more difficult. If I came before this board 10 or 15 years ago, it would probably wouldn't have been before the board hardly. It would have just gone through. And um, and so that's uh, that's why we're proposing it. Uh, I will have to say one thing that I've learned tonight. Uh, learn why y'all get paid such large salaries. <laughs> so, uh, but I appreciate your time and I appreciate uh, what you do. Uh, we're blessed. We've always been blessed. We'll continue to be blessed. However, uh, y'all rule on the property. But we do just would like. To, I would like to think there's some trust between the citizens in, in the county and, uh, and, the, and those who govern over us. And like I say, I live on the property. I'm, I'm the one etched out of the property. And so definitely whatever goes there is going to affect me, you know, more than anybody else. My wife, she wonders why in the world we want to do it. She likes the cows. And, um, and so I just ask y'all's consideration to, to approve it the way we've asked. And uh, we will definitely work with the county. Uh, we don't really want to sell the property, but the first thing you look, if you look at anybody, for example, the Sheets family, we'll look them up. I'm, I don't know if y'all are familiar with the Sheets convenience stores. Mm -hmm. It's much like a Wawa. You know, you, you pull up their website. If you pull up their application, the first question is, what is the property zoned? And so you can't even really go any further in, in exploring avenues as to what you could possibly do with the property unless it's zoned properly. And it's not to say that we may want to go that way. Somebody might come in with a better idea than what we can have. And, uh, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's difficult for me to wrap my, my mind around the fact that we have a general business uh, category in zoning that somehow we can't trust that the things that that's zoned for should be put there. And I understand that things have to be organized and have to be coordinated, but I think the use of uh, just communication between, you know, Donna, I've known her all my life, and the people here in this county, I, I think that's, that's something that needs to be done. Something needs to be said about that. So um, that's why we're requesting what we are. We'd like to have it conform to our whole property. Two-thirds of it is already zoned general business. We'd just like to, to complete that. Oh, I have a question in it probably going to go to you Donna and I do want to address Mr. Sawyer that it's not that we don't trust you I've known you a long time and your parents so that it's not a trust issue my issue is Donna if we grant this conventional rezone and Mr. Sawyer decides to sell the property and a developer comes in and says well I'm going to develop these 12 acres residential they would they then have to come back to you guys to get it the the uh, residential per, uh, permit and yes 
Okay. They would have to come back through staff. And if it were zone general business, they would s there would be a compatibility issue with doing a residential use in an employment area. Um, ultimately, it would be a decision by the board to make in terms of a use permit or, you know, approval of a of a uh, subdivision. It may not come back before the planning board, but it would definitely be a a public review. Thank you. Through the subdivision process. It's not that I personally I don't that I do trust you. I know you well, but it's just that we have to do what we think is best for the county. And we understand it's your property and you would like to do with it what you want, but we just have to make sure that what you want is okay with the the county uh, land use plan with a small area plan in your area and um, it's a difficult right so and I, and I do hope that you would not think that we don't trust you if if this gets denied well I think that my problem is is why even have the uh, conventional application if we're going to get to the place where that everything's got to be planned out there's so many things that was amazing just a few years ago which i'm glad to see things are, are opening up there's from from coin jock bridge to here at the courthouse there were like eight empty buildings that were zoned business in business districts and i got to thinking about it it's because somebody had planned those out and just put them there and maybe it was their own ideas maybe it was some somehow part of this involvement that's why i, I kind of related it to a planned you know planned marriage is because there were, there were seven or eight buildings that were empty <clears> that had been planned out. And I think what we need more of is, is an, an openness as to what really needs to come to an area. I believe that, you know, as we wait and, um, and really seek the Lord just on what we want to do with things, that's what we do in our corporation. And that's how it comes about. And, and there needs to be an openness. And if, if it's not going to be an openness, let's just do away with that application. Then everybody that would come before you, they'd have to have a set plan. But you'd be dealing with people. And it really bothers me that citizens don't feel comfortable coming forward without, and I appreciate Mark Bissell and everything, but, you know, you've got to have somebody professional to come and talk for you in front of y'all. And I just don't like that. I like to have the communication between a community. We're losing that in Curry Tuck. And that does bother me. So. Anyone have other questions, comments? Just about any any plan anybody had there would would have to come back to staff am i correct on that through staff yeah if it if it were a site plan for let's say for instance he he works out a deal with a, a business and they want to bring in a site plan it would go through staff most likely staff review only either through a major or a minor site plan unless of course the use required a use permit And there are some elements that can be worked out through site plan review that would generally apply to any lot. Um, there are some buffers that can be worked out. The, the campus light setting is, is and, and the inability to do strip development out there, and I'm not saying that David would do that, um, but it's the compatibility items that, that are of concern by staff. Well, I'm sure David if, would do a the, very nice development or sell it to someone who would. If the, um, I, don't <clears throat> quite, I don't quite understand how the, the Maple Barco plan really is of any effect if it doesn't have an effect on the properties that are outlined in your, in other words, does, doesn't that, if someone, in other words, the development has to somehow fit in there even if it is general business, isn't mm -hmm. that correct? That's Yes. So like it's it's like, you know, layer upon layer of requirements it seems like this that's placed upon my cow pasture. <laughs> and uh and it, again, um our situation is not to rush into anything. But you know, I told dad the other day, my dad he's eighty eight, and mom eighty seven, and brother and sister, they make up Ponderosa. And I told him I said, you know, um and I tried to get somebody to handle this for me last December. For four months, I asked them to try to get here and pay them to come and do this for me. Go ahead and just go through it. You can't, you can't pay anybody. You can't get anybody to do anything, it seems like, anymore. And I told them, I said, if we'd done it 10 or 12 years ago, it would have just been a matter of paperwork. And we wouldn't have had any, any involvement in this. So. 
And, uh, and I don't want to be one that comes and causes y'all to have uh, things that are difficult. I feel like it's fairly simple in my own mind is what I'm asking. You know, I appreciate everything that you've said. And 10 or 12 years ago, it would have been totally different, but then the county wouldn't have already sunk untold millions in what's across the street. And I think all they're looking for is a cohesive, compatible standard that's going to be carried on next door. Uh, yeah, we understand. Uh, and, and I don't th I think that's asking, uh, you know, a great deal that that, that – that look is compatible on both sides of the road uh, five years from now. It's, it's, not, it's not the use, whether it's a doctor, lawyer, Indian chief, or a sheets market. It's how those sheets markets. There are McDonald's, and then there are McDonald's. Right. The days of the Golden Arches are gone. You know? So it, it's all from a design perspective. Yeah. Uh, do, do you feel that it, it, it's not it, – it's – not fuel, or it's going to be an exercise in futility to to uh, continue discussions with the county to try to work on a cohesive package. Well, I think it'd be another six or eight months, and uh, I think the restrictions that we end up with would be of no value to us, as far as, as you know, something we're not going to we're not going to go outside of the restrictions that they're going to put on us, and. Um, I mean, you know, it's kind of strange. I've made this comment, and we're going to say it tonight and everything, but when we developed the mobile home park, we were all out there by ourselves. And I often wonder if the county uh, had their way, if they'd really want the mobile home park there. So you still have a mobile home park alongside this property. And we want to improve the whole area. We want to have something that would be a benefit to the people that live there. So I know that the county has kind of built a crown jewel there, but it's, it's for the community. It's for all people. You know, it doesn't. And just because we dress it up, and and everything doesn't mean problems exist in other areas. So, so, well, I'm just getting off base. But I, I don't have any problem working with the county. But that's what I would like to do with our development as we develop it here on. Because we'll have to go to the county to have the development, and and we'd just like to be able to do it as business. If that makes sense. One thing oh. I would like to point out is, is David did express that he does, he does in fact want to work with the county. He does in fact want to do something that would be compatible. And not saying that he wouldn't, but you know, there's that he he's agreeing to do that. However, there's no guarantee, and I know, I'm not saying your word is not yeah. what you say it is because right. I, I believe it is. Yeah, I went to Peter Bishop about two and a half years ago and asked him for his ideas as to what we could maybe partner in and do something with the property. And uh, then once we decided we needed to go ahead and move forward on this, um, I met with Donna, then Donna, you know, arranged a meeting with Dan. And we talked about how that I, we would like to have something that would be uh, on the face, the same colors, same brick mm -hmm. as to what the county's doing across the road and all of that. And so that's the kind of development we would like to do. And, um, and we've made our, you know, we've made our uh, corporation profitable by renting, uh, leasing. So, you know, that's probably what we're going to be looking to do is partner with somebody. So we're going to still be involved with is our plans. I think one of the concerns is, say, when, when a developer comes in and wants to do homes, we like we look at elevations. We know what we're buying, and all good intention aside, we don't still don't know what the county's buying, and that's maybe where. I don't know how it can be worked out, you know, to, for, yeah. so that everybody can feel yeah. uh, at ease with each other. Right. Um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Getting back to the arranged marriage, I don't know exactly what she looks like either. <laughs> no, come on. I don't have a shotgun in my pocket or anything like that. It, you know, everybody works. It, it works out for everybody's uh, best interest in, in the end. I truly believe that, you know, when the whole thing is planned out uh, in advance and and. And, and that consistency is is uh, adhered to. Um, what what expenses are usually on a conditional? What expenses? Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, there would be a plan, and I, and I wouldn't say it would have to be something that you would have to See, spend we, we a could, great deal of money on. Right. See, I we could draw up a plan and all, and then then after it's done, 
if you want to change that plan in any way, then you've got to go back through the whole process and everything. We can and, make it somewhat generic. Yeah. And I think you and I have talked about that. And, um, yeah. Maybe put some some architectural minimal architectural standards, um, access controls, signage. Um, you know that pedestrian improvements. See to me, all this is common sense. I mean, if I'm well, gonna, I know. You know, <laughs> it would seem that, but it never it never is. It never is. It, it's taking well, something. I'll just, for I'll just leave it up, y'all. We're just going to run in circles, and and I, I hope you hear our heart. Um, you know, I've been I've been part of this county my whole life, and uh, and uh, I, I'll end with my favorite quote: "Is uh, I moved back to my hometown only to find I was looking for my childhood." Yeah. So, uh, thank you for your. Could time. I ask you a question, Mr. Sawyer? Certainly. This board has three options for this item. We can approve it, and pass it. We can deny it, or we can table it. And simply ask you if you would be willing to work with staff for to come up with a reasonable for you and for uh, the county conditional rezoning if we came up with that motion and it passed to table would you be willing to to see that through with the county and Donna stated that they'd be willing to work with you to make it minimal restrictions and try not to cost you a pile of money to do it. Could, could we do that without going through the whole process of reapplication? And there would need to be a reapplication. What's your timing in terms of? I'm David going to, takes going to, a very I'm nice going to Florida and <laughs> here very soon. <laughs> These, yeah, now, now you're really pushing it on me. Yeah. Um, I have no problems well, with I doing the know. obvious. I mean, that's that's what bothers me. I think about the whole thing is is I don't have no problem with doing the obvious. Of, through the hoops of this and that and and you know the, the sad thing is later on somebody could pay somebody to get up here and do a whole lot better job of speaking about it later but you know doing something different but um are you going to market the property between well i'm sure you probably will um while you're on vacation did you what, what's your goal do you want to have something in place before you leave or try to have something in place shortly after you get back um, it, it really doesn't matter. I just like I just like to end it. I've been going on a year now. Like I said, I started talking with someone last year about handling it for me while I was out mm -hmm. of town. But um, I just like to have it rezoned. That's what I'd like to do. I'd like to. That's what I've come to request it to do. So um, so I don't know. Um, we have if, if you vote on it and deny, it, I'll have to put a new application in anyway. I guess. No, it would. It would move on to the Board of Commissioners with the recommendation from the Planning Board of Denial. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. And then you would make your argument to them for a final decision. Have Although we'd like, we'd like to move it forward with a positive recommend, recommendation from staff and the Planning oh, Board. I have the same idea then. <laughs> I think that's where we need to maybe table this and you all maybe get together and maybe we sit down and with, get and get it done with the economic I've development I've been getting it done director. for I mean I've had to wait 3 months for this meeting here to get it done I know and Mr. so Mr. Sawyer can excuse me can you understand that without coming right out and saying it we are trying our best to help you we don't personally I don't want to come out and say we deny I deny it I I would hate to vote that way However, however, there's so <laughs> many things in these rules that the county has, call them what you will, that we have to operate by. And even though it might not make a bit of sense to you, and I understand common sense, I have a little, yeah. but I hope that you get the feeling from us that it's not that we don't trust you, it's that we have to abide by the rules, and we're trying so hard to make this a little more simple for you even though you think it's already simple enough right I, I would appreciate this I would appreciate a, a working towards eliminating something that's never going to be used and that being just a conventional general business that would that would eliminate everybody having to come through this and trying to do what they want to with their property they've owned for such a long time because apparently it's never approved um, 
So if you would, I'd just like for you to vote on what I presented tonight. I, I keep coming back to the question of the problems that staff has with the architectural standards and whatnot of maybe done with it after it's rezoned to general business. Are those issues not mainly addressed with site plan approval or the Maple Barco small area plan? Some of them can be. Absolutely, some of them can be. However, most of them cannot be. Building components, constructions, it cannot be. Um, we we can't say thou shall do brick or David agrees to do that and we accept it. Um, those are not addressed those in are site not plan addressed approval. In the ordinance, mm -mm, in terms of site plan review, signage, general sign sign requirements are provided in there general pedestrian requirements what about internal the not external small area plan are there architectural standards with that no it's more site what, it's more site for. design <laughs> and um there there are no architectural standards it's just to show compatibility like if he and, and i and i'm not we're not saying he has to submit building elevations because we know he's he doesn't have a plan for that yet but if he agrees to doing certain com components to the construction um, outside of the ordinance requirements that would show compatibility, signage, pedestrian circulation, access controls, that's, it's really minimal. Some uses that would be excluded. I mean, obviously you wouldn't want to see like a, I'm not saying this is a bad use in any, in any sense, but a used car lot. I mean, that's not something you would want to see there, nor would the county. I'm not saying it's a bad use. I'm not saying it, it's just not something that would probably be compatible in that area. Um, some minimal things that would be allowed in the general business zoning district that could be excluded. Not saying you're, you're tied down to retail or you're tied down to um, office or, you know. Well, so I, let I me think, ask you this. I, could, you, could you put together everything or do I need to hire somebody to take into I, I feel like we could, we could come to an agreement on uses. I feel like we could probably come to an agreement on buffers. Um, layout might be a little difficult for staff, but maybe we could do um, some general things that you, that you could agree, that you could present and agree to, and the county could accept. And... I don't know what they are right now. Right. Uh, See, the, but I think I think we probably could look at s site elements, you know, alignments of driveways, um, not having any direct access to um, shortcut road. You'd have an internal access that would be controlled for all your your projects. That would give that what it's termed in the in the small area plan that campus setting. Something right. that would be, you know. See, our situation is, is we want to partner with somebody that's, that's more or less an expert in all this. Right. We don't have to become an expert in it. And so for me to take and try to figure out what the county wants, what, you know, I, we want to partner with somebody. Like, if you, for instance, Sheets. I, 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 I like that family setting. I don't, haven't talked with them or anything. But, you know, I'm not going to tell them what they're going to do on how to build it. I'm not going to tell them we're the best place to, to build an entrance to the property. They have experts in doing all that, and that's the people that we would like to partner with, and nothing against the county, but the county's into, you know, trying to control development and everything else, but why not work in the, you know, with the best people you can get to know how it needs to be developed? And that's what we're after. Um, we're not wanting to throw up a used car lot and just something like that. And, um, and I understand, you know, that, that what what the county is, has y'all in is a situation of somehow trying a, a control of how planning and development is. And I think the county's done a good job. I mean, a lot of people will complain about some of the things in the county about development, but development's coming. And and we do a good job of planning it. But I get back to that place where that people who own the land still need to have some rights as to to really being able to negotiate how the land is developed and and the county has to have some type of faith in, in that it coming along right when somebody stands up and asks for their land to be rezoned. So. I know it's really difficult. It's difficult for staff to, yeah. for something that is 
generally compliant with your plans, but not site-wise. You just don't know if it's meeting the policies of the plan. I mean, generally, it's I don't see any issues with it being um, not compliant, but yeah. um, it's, whole the it's just the extent. It's just an extension of the zoning district, but yeah. it's when it comes to the site design that provides the concern. Site design, building elements. You know, well, and, I, I, and I don't know how else to address that other than through the conditional zoning. Or, or, I, know, or, I know David says he'll do it, and I feel, I feel comfortable that he would. Mm -hmm. But you, I mean, he he's not going to be the developer. He'll sell it, and he'll you know he'll he will negotiate with them and try to get them to do what. What we've all agreed to, because he lives there. I mean, I, I, I get that. But guaranteeing that that happens is where we all struggle. It's, it's unfortunate that we have, now we have 2020 hindsight, because we've got this area. There should have been an overlay for that district if the county, if the commissioners have the same concerns that we do right now. Yes. That should have been created in advance before they put tens of millions of dollars into this facility and then all the I's would have been dotted and all the T's would have been crossed. So now we're playing catch up, you know, and we don't even have any guarantee are they listening? <laughs> that the commissioners have the same concerns that we do. True. They often don't, as we all know. <laughs> one one thing to point out, I mean this is this area is somewhat similar to what's going on in Moyak where you did the Moyak small area plan, out of the small, Moyak small area plan became the mega site. Which Haven't was, they renamed that yet? Yeah, it's, uh, okay, I'll call, I'll call it. I'll We're call not it going there. Very tight okay. <laughs> <laughs> Carol, would you tell Come us on, what Carol. it is? <laughs> What's it called? Carol? No, I won't call it that. <laughs> I'm going to call it I the mega heard. site. What is it? Curry Tuck Station. Oh. So it's at, better than mega site. At, <laughs> <laughs> Anything's that, better than mega site. Out of that small area plan, came a more concentrated effort and eventually we'll we'll have regulations soon uh, hope, hopefully very soon we'll have regulations that will be specific to that site that site because what works in laurel woods is not necessarily going to work up exactly. there exactly exactly so we did this he's unfortunately caught right he now is. and 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 i'm he sorry is. for that i really am and we've done the small area plan, and I foresee probably in the future, I don't know how immediate that future is, um, something very similar probably being done here in the Ma in that Maple Barco area, some concentrated hope effort yeah, hope to, sooner rather than later. To, to create a plan for future development here. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, David's kind of caught in between that. So, I mean, it. there are some elements that can be addressed through site plan. I do want to point that out. But there are some elements that can't be. And it's... Well, I'll go to the commissioners of whatever y'all decide and we'll... And we can, we can all, well... Hire a mouthpiece maybe to go before them so I'll look fancy. If, in fact, <laughs> let's say for worst case scenario, something happens and the board turns it down, it does require you to wait a year or significantly change your request if by chance if you do it if you do it if you do a conditional is that significantly changing it depends your... on what it would be and that's a good point because if we table it you don't have to wait that time right correct yes you can continue on with the effort with without any interruption and get it done long before i feel like we want to support your request mm -hmm. I do too. I think I'm feeling I have nothing wrong with the overall view. Yeah, I don't. A good thing tonight. Yeah. Okay. Well, I appreciate y'all being polite. So I'll get with Donna and we'll take and um, let her work some more since she doesn't work enough on this. <laughs> <and> <laughs> She's willing she to do it. Can she can stay tomorrow night and work on this. I like meeting so, with you, David. So, so. I'd like yeah. to probably pull together maybe economic development and okay. for us to. Okay, just and just don't want to pull at people that get in my wallet. I'd that, that bothers well, me. Well, you know, it, it, it I'm, glad you, I'm yeah. sorry, but it bothers me when Understood. I've got to pay somebody 
to make up something that has of no sense and no consequence to what we're doing. But I'm, I'm no, glad you, you said that because I think you're in a position right now that uh, you can force the county's hand to pick up the tab on this thing because an overlay district would solve your problems. And let them do it. shouldn't cost you a dime. I can spend the county's money. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you know, you At some point, that may actually happen, and then he could come in with the request. But in that interim time, it... You can sketch it out, anyway. She's, you know, she's getting in my pockets, what she's saying. <laughs> you you talked about having to hire experts. I mean, quite frankly... You've done a better job there than are, the experts. There are more experts in our planning department than... Yeah, I, I could shake a stick at. I'm impressed with their knowledge and agree. and their willingness to work. So I, I think I would not even begin to think about hiring anybody. I'll meet anybody. with Don and we'll we'll do it. And, um, okay, so we have to. I'm going to close the public hearing and thank you very much, Mr. Sawyer. Thank you. And uh, at this time, I will entertain a motion. And I'd, I'd like to. We table it. Uh, well, may I speak? I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Oh, I thought you were it's in been a while motion. Since I'm sorry. <laughs> I would like to make the motion that we table <laughs> this and recommend that the applicant initiate a request that could more adequately address the compatibility elements of the Maple Barco Small Area Plan, the 2006 Land Use Plan, including but not limited to access control pedestrian elements, signage, buffers, and all that other stuff. I second that request. <laughs> all right. We have a motion and we have a second to table this item. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. The item has been tabled. Motion carried. Okay, people, we've been here for two hours. Woo. And we still got to deal with Lori and her six-hour presentation. They're bringing in a snack, oh. aren't they? Isn't it, isn't it snack time? So would anybody like just to take about five minutes and stretch your legs? Yes, indeed. All right. Five minutes. Okay. Like we're getting the rest of the year. Shall we commence? The next item is PB17-08, Connect Curry Tuck Pedestrian Master Plan. Mm -hmm. Curry Tuck County requests adoption of the Connect Curry Tuck Pedestrian Master Plan which will serve as a guiding document and blueprint for implementation and funding of pedestrian facilities in the county. And this I make is a motion Mr. We Cicero. Approve. Huh? I make a motion we approve. Yeah, really. <laughs> Second. Bless you, Tammy. Um, I'll try to be as brief as I can. Um, mm -hmm. Most of you were... <laughs> In a September 18th work session um, where uh, we had consultants from um, Alta de uh, Planning and Design um, discuss uh, the finer points and the bigger issues of, of Connect Curry Tuck. Um, uh, this is our pedestrian master plan, and uh, this is done in conjunction with the uh, North Carolina Department of Transportation pedestrian planning grant uh, that the county received. Uh, typically, these are done at towns, with towns, small towns, larger cities. Um, but in 2015, the uh, DOT changed their policy and allowed counties to uh, to apply. We applied the first year of uh, the counties were eligible, and we received the grant. Um, so this is um, a guiding document, um, <laughs> and a, <laughs> to to uh, to quote our agenda item. Um, it's a blueprint for implementation of funding for pedestrian facilities in the county. This looks at the county as a whole, um, the, both the mainland and, and Kerala. Um, and uh, what before you is a draft, and uh, there are still some updates, some revisions that uh, we need to make. Um, but overall, I think this captures some of the concerns, some of the big projects that the county is looking at. Uh, for pedestrian uh, facilities. Um, this is a, like, a, it, like it says, a blueprint. This, um, it calls out three, sorry, it was been a, it's been a couple of hours since uh, I looked at this and my brain is, is not working as well as it, it was earlier this evening. Um, there are three main hubs, uh, two on the mainland, uh, and then Kerala, and then we have uh, two sub-hubs. 
um, where we're looking at more specific um, projects, pedestrian facilities, safe crossings, uh, maybe some improved sidewalk areas, um, the Moyak area, the Grandy area, and the Maple Barco uh, Curry Tuck area. Um, so that's three, and then the Kerala, and then we have two sub hubs. Um, Um, oh, where did it go? Uh, Jarvisburg and the lower end of the county, the sub hubs. There was a Palm yeah. Point, yeah. Harbinger. <laughs> Harbinger. So, um, This pedestrian plan gives the county a list of improvements to make, not only um, actual projects, but it also uh, things that we can improve in our, our policies, uh, some revisions we can make in our UDO to make it more pedestrian friendly, um, programs that maybe we could implement, um, education and outreach, and even a little bit of enforcement, different types of programs that we can make pedestrian uh, safety and accessibility just a higher priority. Uh, and it also, at the end of the day, it does give us a list of projects that um, probably the majority of these projects we can work with DOT to, to improve uh, pedestrian, the pedestrian facilities, pedestrian access, and pedestrian safety in the county. Um, since, you, since several of you were at a work session, um, you know some, several of the projects. I don't know if you have any specific questions about any of the projects in the plan that I could answer at this point? I'll, I'll make one comment on this whole thing, and I wasn't there, and I apologize for that, but it was a, a family emergency that had to be dealt with. Um, I think you were. The, this work oh, session oh, was yeah. held in September oh, for, yeah, the, for the Connect, one, yeah, Car Connect Curry Tuck, um, yes. The, the, the quiet street um, issue. Mm hmm uh, my community has spent 12 grand on radar signs that have made a marked improvement within the community itself. So where those uh, streets are designated, uh, that could well be a way to uh, to help that along without actual law enforcement. It's, it's made a big difference. I, I, didn't, I was not a believer. I, I, I said, before you spend 12 grand, go knock on the people's door that are speeding and tell them to stop. You know, that was my approach. Uh, but they spent the money and it's worked. Mm -hmm. what, what is it? Radar signs. Radar. Radar Tell you signs. how fast you're going. You take a picture of, the, of digital. Yeah, like digital, a digital readout for speed, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't take a picture. It just... No, it doesn't do that. There's no, no enforcement. It just tells you you're going too fast. Right. It, it spells it right out, 22, 27, 35, whatever. And it's, it's helped a great deal within the community. That's my two cents. Excuse me. Uh, um. We are waiting for final sign-off from, from DOT to make sure this um, is, like I said, gets all their, hits all their requirements for a pedestrian plan. We um, have worked with them, through with them, a partner in this project. So what you see before you isn't the absolute final draft, um, but I think with a few revisions and, and, and final sign-off on DOT, uh, this represents a really good um, draft of where we need to be, good ideas, good projects, um, and, and lots of good community input, I think. Tammy and I worked, we've were, been working on this project since April. So um, if you have any, yeah, like, I keep saying if you have any questions about um, about this. And I'm sorry it was not an absolute final draft, but we're trying to get it um, to the Board of Commissioners before the end of the year. Uh, I mean, we've waited pretty much as long as we could to bring it to you guys waiting for, for, for final sign-off from DOT. I just want to make sure I understand something. Uh, I've heard some comments like, 
why is the county spending money on this kind of garbage when there's so many other things we need more readily? As I understand it, is the county paying anything or all this money coming from DOT? For the actual plan or the project implement plan? For the plan itself, um, we did receive a grant. It was a matching grant. It was, uh, I think, due to our population, it was 30% um, uh, uh, on the county and 70% on DOT. Uh, so we did receive the majority of the funding for this. I think um, I'd have to check. Tammy, do you remember offhand the, the final? Um, I feel like, and, and I, I can get this information to the planning board, but I think uh, the county's contribution was less than 20000 I want to say eighteen um, because of the 730 close match. Enough. That's close enough. That's close. Um, so and, uh, and we're back to this is um, this is a DOT when when approved uh, it will be a, a, a DOT plan that when that when we do have projects um, you know such as improving things in Grandy or um, you know over the next 10 15 20 years as improvements are made to, to Caratoke Highway that um, when they come in and do traffic calming or access management or these different uh, nice little buzzwords that DOT uses we can get some pedestrian facilities, some sidewalks and areas. You know, I would love to see sidewalks in, around in Grandy between around the food line, around you know Walnut um, Walnut Island, better pedestrian crossings uh, and facilities like that. So having this plan in place when DOT comes through uh, to do these projects, we can then you know cite this plan and request um, better better infrastructure for for pedestrians. I think it's ironic. It's like a business plan you go to before you go to a bank, but you're getting money from DOT so they can give you more money. Essentially, yes. Questions, folks? Comments? <clears throat> Anything? All like right. the quiet streets on the side, are they ever intended to have a sidewalk or maybe sometime but I, not I, in the initial plan i think it's, it would depend on, on the environment um i think in 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 certain areas um you would have you would have uh the right of way with you'd have the 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 quality the the you would have enough viable space um for a sidewalk a quiet street um I, and I'm thinking of Walnut Island in particular. Um, I don't know just the limitations of the water table and the existing right of way if you would ever be able to truly have a sidewalk without significant uh, money oh. investment in there in, in, right. in Walnut Island. Um, so I think it would depend on each individual project whether, you know, a quiet street would long term turn into a sidewalk somewhere. Well, I was just general. Because I know most of the newer subdivisions, which end up being a side street, they somewhat require a sidewalk in part of the plan. Right. All of all of the, in in our any new subdivision um, is, are required to have sidewalks and, and pedestrian facilities. Now, going back and retrofitting older subdivisions, um, you know, like Mr. McCauley's or like Walnut Island, it would be a significant you know monetary investment to do that so uh and something like a quiet street in certain areas i think could um could function well so um that now there was uh a, a, at the original presentation that, that you guys came to in september um there was a quiet street in the uh in the wellhead subdivision we received uh uh negative feedback from the community about that so um that specific project uh that recommendation was pulled out of this but we still have quiet streets as a tool in the pedestrian toolbox that this plan that does yeah that was the one way um so it's a little it's a it's a not quite just a quiet street but a, a takeoff on that a version of that the one way with the bollards in there um so the bollards that would separate the pedestrian from the traffic that was taken out. So, when it comes to noisy street, they'll think about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's Grandy Road. 
like the improvements you show in the plan at Grandy Intersection at the food line. You're saying if we adopt this plan, when DOT gets to do their next project that will they'll do road work at that intersection, they'll improve it per how we want it on the plan. Yes, um, per how we want it on the plan or how it's listed in the plan. It also gives us a chance to go to DOT and um, in certain areas, and, and I'm specifically thinking of the Grandy intersection, where we could go uh, to DOT um, and there's certain amount of funding uh, available through the division for certain specific projects. I think the county could go to DOT and, and specifically the Grandy intersection and request money for improvement of our, our pedestrian there without greater, you know, without a bigger project of, of, of maybe the divided highway or whatever ultimately DOT comes in and does for the for Caretook Highway. But I think that's something with this plan in place, we could go and ask DOT for project-specific money for that. What exactly would it be? Anything else? Okay. Anything else, Lori? I do not. I was trying to find the exact amount for you. For the <laughs> That's all right. Okay. Well, then we will move on, and I will now entertain a motion to adopt or not adopt this particular plan. I move that we adopt the plan. We have a, mo a motion to move. Do I have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, like sign. Approved. All righty. You didn't take your six hours, Lori. You sure? Well done, Lori. <laughs> All right. Next item. Next up to bat. Here we go. Here. PB 17-10, Curry Tuck County Text Amendment. Request to amend U UDO to modify the definition of addition and to update the exemptions to the requirement that no necessary use shall be on a lot prior to development of an associated principal use. And this is Jason. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. Um, forgive me if I speak quickly because I'm hungry and... Aww. <laughs> I think everybody wants to go home. Nobody wants to go home. We're all happy. Do. Um, so I do. Order pizza? Yeah. <laughs> um, item one, uh, as far as the text amendment is concerned, um, talks about parking of vehicles in the off-road area, which is the single-family remote zoning district. Uh, and allow and allowing those the parking of those vehicles without a principal use on the property and what that basically means is a vacant lot in this in this case so uh, the county is sponsoring the text of amendment to allow the parking of two vehicles uh, on on any vacant lot in that zoning district <clears throat> um, having said that uh, it's also been proposed that a trailer also be allowed. Um, so that's open for discussion. Among boat trailer. A boat trailer. That's correct. Boat trailer in particular. Oh. Right. So the way this is written up um, obviously isn't ready for you guys to make a you know decision on it. It, it obviously needs to be changed uh, somewhat. So, But I'll leave that up to you. Um, so that's pretty much it. It's simple, um, straightforward. We're, we're adding the language, and you can see here um, in your packet that uh, we've made basic changes to the way it's written just by putting it in list form and then uh, adding letter E. That's pretty much all I have for that one. It's, it is what it is. Okay. Questions? Unless, comments? Unless Lori is going to give some background. I, I was just going to say, technically right now, um, in, in the off-road area or in any zoning district, um, uh, residential, uh, zone, uh, residential zoning district, uh, parking is considered an accessory use, um, and you would need to have 
your your residence or whatever your principal use is in place before you could park a vehicle. Um, this has come up during a code enforcement issue, so we're trying to address that because the off-road area is unique where people can boat over, um, bring a boat over, and, and then get to their lot <coughs> and then be able to get in their four-wheel drive and, and go enjoy the beach, good riding around the off-road area. So you know, technically, those cars that are parked there now are violating the zoning ordinance. So we're trying to address that because it is um, historically it's what has been done. They've just historically been violating the zoning ordinance, the, uh, the UDO. Just, just for my own clarification, because I don't get up there. <clears throat> People just leave four-wheel drive vehicles sitting around on their on their lots. Yes, sir. I can't. That, that's the impression I got. I just wanted. That's to sure. exactly right. They come uh, over Jason, by boat and utilize them. Uh, if we decided tonight to make a motion with the verbiage in the motion that item E, instead of saying one trailer, we just change that to a boat trailer, could we go ahead and proceed with that tonight? Just changing yeah, the verbiage I don't see a bit. Why not? Full approval? Right. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I ask what is the specific issue that's coming up in the code enforcement up there? Is it too many vehicles on lots? Well, I mean, is it people parking five, ten cars on one lot? Or well, I think it's the fact that you're parking cars there or vehicles um, without a primary use. Uh, we're back to the the parking of vehicles is is accessory to. A, a principal use, which you know, in, in, up there would typically be a single family home, um, but because there's no, their lots are vacant, there's no single family home, there have you have an accessory use without a principal use. If, if I, got I think I can answer your question. Um, you're asking if there's a, an actual issue with the parking of the cars, right? And I think that what she's saying is it's really just that it's not allowed right now, mm -hmm. but folks are doing it. You're supposed to have a house there first before you park cars. Technically, the yes. The ordinance, the, ordinance, the way the ordinance is written now, yes. It's being enforced without complaints? It's not being enforced. It is, we're receiving complaints because, like I said, it's, this so is... So somebody is complaining that people are doing this. Is that the people that live up there? No, we were doing a, a code enforcement. Um, yeah. Our code enforcement yeah. officer was doing his job. Yeah, not me too. And and Several it was ones. seeing these vacant lots where people. Okay, so he wasn't were following up complaints to begin with. He was just out cruising the area, saying. Yes. Okay, gotcha. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure that a bunch of homeowners weren't doing the initial complaining. No. Okay. Once they got, once they received the enforcement notification, then they voiced that they had been doing this historically for years. Um, and so now we're enforcing on what has been typically d historically done in the off-road area. I like your idea. Any other discussion? If not, I will entertain a motion. I should probably mention. I make a motion that we uh, conditionally approve this um, when the. Simple change is made from one trailer to one boat trailer. Right. I second it. All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All, right. aye. All those not in favor? All right, thank you. Passed. Easy peasy. Yeah, that one was good. Thank you, Jason. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Good work, Jason. Next one PB 1711, Curry Tuck County. Discussion of potential text amendments to UDO regarding stormwater accessory uses and cupola. Cupolas? Is that how you say it? Cupola. Oh, excuse me. Cupolas. I'm with you. I <laughs> Jason, yours again. Yes. Um, I want to start by saying that this was originally listed on the um, agenda as um, something for you to take action on an actual text amendment being put forward. We are now uh, moving that to the discussion section. And so, um, having said that, we'll go ahead and discuss it. Um, basically, what we're doing here is trying to change the definition of addition in a way that uh, is more simple, easy to understand, maybe closer to the language in the building code. 
Um, in particular, we've had conversations with the chief building inspector about the fact that um, the words that are in the current definition that talk about um, common load bearing walls is problematic. Um, and because that's not always how additions are constructed. So to put that limit on there really is, uh, can cause issues. Um, in more ways than one. In more ways than one. That's right. Um, so we're proposing uh, this language you see here. And like I said, it's pretty, it's pretty simple compared to what we have now. It says simply that an extension or increase in the floor area or height of an existing building or structure. So, um, as opposed to the, the lengthy definition we had before that included the language, like I said, about load bearing walls. I saw that once, but I lost it. Are you looking for what page it's on? I think we got it. It's page, page 189 and 190. Back So this, gotcha, this definition gotcha. that we have put forward here today does not um, exactly match the building code definition. Um, it's been suggested by the chief building inspector that we maybe do that. But this is what we this is what we brought forward today. And I don't know if there's any background information to discuss or over overall ideas of why we're doing this, but. I think it's basically just to make it clearer and simpler. To make it clearer and, like Jason said, to bring it in alignment, um, this one definition uh, of addition, to bring it uh, closer in alignment with, with the building code, um, there are several jurisdictions that don't even address the addition or the definition of addition. Uh, we did uh, some canvassing of, of some neighboring jurisdictions and, and other uh, coastal counties, and um, of the ones that that we canvassed, that we surveyed, uh, probably 60% of them don't even have an addition definition. I think some, for some people it's intuitive, other people it's not. Um, and I think ours is ever really complicated. Um, and this is something that uh, the staff, that we've all thought that. But um, so we're bringing it to you for discussion and get some input from the planning board on it. Um, and we'll probably return to this to you at a, at a later time after this discussion. As a non-builder, it makes sense to me. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> Are we going with the 25% of the roof dimension? Is that what you're talking about? Not the cupola, I don't think. Oh, no, we're not yeah, about the cupolas yet. yet. We're, this is still, we're just talking about uh, the definition this of addition. One. It's, uh, it's item two in the first case, 1710, mm -hmm. on page 188, 189, 190. So, then we can bring this back to you if there's any input. I would like to, and Mr. O'Brien, with his, his knowledge, if he's... Um, I'd like to have input from him if he would like to, but um, any of you, um, but like I said, no action, just dis for discussion tonight. Right. Nobody has. Anything? We're a quiet group. Any discussion? Well, I think not that's so it. much. You not know, just yet. Everybody okay with this at this point? Yes, I believe so. Okay, so since there's no action necessary, thank you for your presentation. You're welcome. Okay. On to the next one, right? Yes, we have several items for discussion tonight. Okay. First on the list is cupolas. Yeah. Um, we've had recent months or over the past year I'm not sure how long we've had a lot of applications for um, homes that have cupolas um, and they have exceeded in our minds the height limit that's listed in the ordinance um, and that's 
a direct result of the fact that our definition of a cupola doesn't really limit them in any kind of way. Um, so that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to come up with language that doesn't overly restrict building, but that really um, is in line with the intent of a cupola and the intent of the ordinance. So you're so, gonna have you're gonna have to limit the height. Some, some, some there's no well, height limit now. Well, we so don't. Have, well, well, there is overall. I would. Well, say. there's a height limit for the building, which is right. a mean roof height that's measured at the peak ridge. Um, and then there are certain things that are exempt from that height limit that can go up above that indefinitely. I mean, you can put a twenty foot cupola. Yes. On. But nobody's going to do that. Hopefully, I say that, but they could. You never know. Oh, never know. Give me some ideas. Here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't think anybody would build a fifteen thousand square foot house in the four wheel drive area either. True. <laughs> Point taken. Um, so we're looking for some guidance from you guys on on how to uh, possibly limit those, so that they actually are cupolas and they're serving the purpose that they were meant to serve. Um, some of the things that we've talked about are maybe limiting their size based on a percentage of the overall roof size, whether it be length, width, both. 25%, um, something like that, is the number we floated um, around. That seems pretty big. It is. But that still doesn't restrict the heights. It does not. That's right. That, to me, is a big issue. There, there's a list of things that are exempt from the height requirements. Right, and a cupola is one yeah, of them. church spires, cupolas, that sort of right. thing. Right. I would think um, there may be a, a different size limitation for, let's call it, attached and detached uh, cupola. Uh, for instance, like I was uh, saying earlier about um, an octagon off a corner of a house or something like that where the, the cupola roof comes right off the main outside walls of the, of the structure uh, that may an overall size of that might be a determination of what can be done there uh, maybe a percentage when you're talking about like a cupola that's in, in an existing roof uh, that comes up through an existing roof uh, something of that nature okay Can you can you further describe that situation with the octagon? Because I'm I'm trying to imagine it being a cupola. What you're what you're describing? Yeah. Uh, well, let, let's just in describing it. Let's say you have a corner outside corner of a building, and you uh, attach an octagon to it, mm -hmm. uh, and it and in a forty five degree fashion, so that it, it, it only one facet of the octagon actually touches the house. Okay. The other seven sides of it, all the way around. Are, are separate. And in Victorian times, it would have been a turret. Yes. Is it above you know, the roof? That round yes, bump it would be. that yep, comes yep. up. I get it. But it wouldn't necessarily extend. Higher, like, it would be, a, it would be higher line, than a roof maybe. line. So, so as you get above the main roof, you actually have eight sides of it showing. You know, the, the, the side that's attached to the house comes up to the, to the roof line of the house and then continues on up. So it goes all the way around eight sides, and then it would have an eight-sided top on it or, or a, a roof on top of it. Or it could be a flat deck, for that matter. It could be anything, really. But uh, but what what uh, the the fact the point being, it's relatively detached from the house. It doesn't come up through the main roof of the house. Like they said earlier, sometimes elevators are added on and look similar. Yeah, yeah, that that, that could definitely be something that could be done there, or a st stairwell or something like that could be done in there. Are, are you building those actually taller? Than, yes, than, I, I have than, it's, than it's, the roof peak. No, what what? Okay. But it, it was what the ones we built were actually we built them up with a flat roof, a flat waterproof roof, and put a rail around them, and put an outside set of steps up to them. Widow's walk. Yeah, more or less. Okay, but, I mean, you you go to New New England, they have widow's walk. You go to Pennsylvania, where I'm from, barns have cupolas. Now they have magnified themselves to be a structure in a house, and it's a viewing room. For this, and maybe you can't even gain access to some of them. For all I know, well, as Could I said, be just we, like a giant skylight. I don't we, know. We put we put an outside spiral set of steps up to them, so so it came off the deck and it went all the way up to the top. And it was about a floor and a half above the main floor, and uh, that was a well, like on some of those that were shown today. 
middle of the house. Yeah, that, that, exactly. 10, or, 10 by 10, 15 by 15, something like that. Do you think that that was just a fancy skylight or it actually had access for viewing to get up there? Oh, I doubt it had any access up into it. It probably was just came up through the roof. Are you talking about the ones we showed? Yeah, that, yeah you can't have four floors. Okay, yeah. right, okay. There's a three three story limit. Right. Mm -hmm. And that would be considered a fourth floor. If you had Yeah, if you had another level up there, right. Foot, right. Yeah, and then uh, yeah, some place to get up there and stand and look out the like windows. Like a yes. real ship's watch uh -huh. type yeah. situation. Right, exactly. I guess I'm saying I'm not sure just for clarification that what you're describing it would be a cupola by standard definition of a cupola. Well, I mean, if Okay, if you built it with a flat deck on it, it probably wouldn't be. But if you put a roof over top of it, uh, then I assume it would be. I'm saying, I guess, that I think that if somebody proposed to build what you're talking about now, that we would apply the standard height limit to that structure. Oh, really? Don't you think? Because it's, it's just a round room with a roof on it. Right. And, and in, my, in, in my mind, a cupola is something that is decorative, that comes off of a roof. And allows either light or air to come into the to the structure. Okay, so you're saying it, it would be coming through and it through the main roof. I'm saying, yeah. yeah, and I'm saying I think that what you're describing would be subject to the mean height limit that we have okay. currently, all right. All right. unless it had a roof of its own and then another dome-like structure on top of that. That part could be a cupola. Okay, um, that's how I would describe it too. But how does the ordinance describe it? That's you know, I mean, well, if it doesn't, we can we, then... can we can read the the current definition quickly if you mm -hmm. if you want to. Um, it says currently the UDO defines a cupola as a dome-like structure on top of a roof or dome, um, often used as a lookout or to admit light and air. Okay. The way that's worded, I read that the same way that you are. Yeah. It, it would come up through the main roof. Of course, this is subject to change, and that's why we're here. But right. I just wanted to make, make sure that everyone understood what we were talking about. Okay. It can be a lookout as long as it's... It's the third story and not the fourth. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Or haven't we sometimes, Jenny, had like halfway point platforms or something, or is that not true? No, you're just looking at the mm -hmm. uh, the old one that she's state. Like how, how much higher, halfway right, up the like floor? Yeah. Floor. Right. <laughs> So I, I guess a, uh, another definition of something like that would be that none of the walls of the cupola are exterior walls or line up with exterior walls. In other words, they would be inside the exterior walls all the way around right. of the right. house. And, and we've said that um, already, and then we got the result of like a six-inch or one-foot bump in from the outside <coughs> walls and then just another <coughs> um, So it may be that we in a combination of the requirement that it not be an outside wall and limit the size of it on top of that. And that would, that's, what, that's what I've written in here. That, those were our initial thoughts. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Somebody would actually do that, spend that kind of money to something that they can't access? Oh, yeah. Yeah, at the beach. That's where it's happening, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, sorry. Let me it's, find a, it's, that. A, it's a nice design feature. I mean, it, 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 it uh, looks good from the outside, and it looks really interesting. This mouse is super slow. Architectural. Yeah. Break it up rather than just one big flat right. roof. Right, exactly. Oh, here. Thank you, Jenny. That's easy to get to. There you go. There we go. So. It's in the cloud. Yeah, uh, yeah I can't see. Oh, it's this yeah, one. The front yeah, one's this in one. the cloud. Yep. This one here. Um, we, we see, isn't that on the outside wall? It definitely is, and that's the issue. Right. So, yeah. so I, I, yeah, we, yeah. Because we, like I said, currently we don't have anything in our language that says trying to create you something. Can't do that. Yeah. See, I would define that as a turret. He's saying the only thing you know because it's connected to the house and not just the roof, the and it doesn't like extend farther like than the top right. of the right. cupola that's, that's on the roof. Yeah. Okay. I, I agree with you. It's not. Uh, do you also make a determination of, of how many you can have per house? or, or, or? We have not done that. Well, I mean, would you? I mean, well, that, that's a possibility. Is that something you would address? I mean, like if you have, to use your number, 25% of the roof can be a cupola. Well, is that 
one twenty five percent size or two twelve and a half or, or you know. Or, I don't. Or, I wonder if it matters at that point. Yes. If 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 you can only cover so much of the roof with it. Right. If you want to split it up into two and have one on to make your house symmetrical, don't know that I care about that really. Okay. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but. I would agree. Twenty five percent. Twenty five percent. That's a lot of roof, though. Twenty five percent of the entire roof. That's a huge number. That's open for discussion. Uh, Eighteen, yeah. maybe. But. Yeah, I, I just think twenty five percent is a large number to have for a good boy. It's a quarter of your roof. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The time you add up all the roof space on the whole building. And then allow twenty five percent of that. That's that's a large number. Yeah. Off the top of your head, what would you think was? I was thinking more like twelve or fifteen, or because I mean it, it's you. That right there is probably. You talk about the middle one now. Well, I'm, yeah, yeah, the big one, the big one on top. You're probably. What would that be? Probably. You can't see the other. <coughs> no, I can't see those elevations. You, you know. so. Oh, there you go. Look, look at that elevation. That's a different one. Though, I mean, right? yeah. So you're you're probably a. Is it? Okay. She says it's the same one. Hard to tell. Significantly less. Yeah, that's a big. That's a different elevation. Yeah, uh, definitely. This one. The very last one in the whole back of the house. Keep going. Yeah. Right there. Oh, yeah. So she's showing you here the. Of course, you probably can't see it, but it's got the uh, square footages. Yeah, I really can't see the numbers, yeah. but I, I'm gonna try to zoom in on it. That's got to be around 25 percent or something like that. Anybody see any numbers on there? No, <laughs> I can't read that. But you. Let me zoom back out, and you get an override, You get an idea of the overall scale of it sitting, right. sitting on the the roof. Right. Um, so you got this middle one here that seems reasonable. Right. And but, then you got the one on the right side that's just ridiculous, in well, in my opinion. Sorry. Yeah. No, I I agree with you. So the three together are well over fifty percent of the roof. I'd say so. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. We're the one in the back. Seventy-five percent. Ten or twelve. Percent. Whoops. Sorry about that. Anything else on this item? Um. No, I mean we have to fine-tune the numbers and things like that. Right. Mm -hmm. Is that something we need to do now, or? Um, I'm going to leave. You that can up make suggestions. Else. Yeah, if you have ideas, we would love that. Yes. <clears throat> okay, I'd say. My suggestion would be like 15%. Total, if you want one or two. Correct, total. You could have five of them if you want to, but they're yeah, going to be. Sounds reasonable. They're going to be 3% each. You're going for 15, you say? I, I, that's what I would think. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Well, I, do, you, do, you, do, you, do you do something? I mean, it's kind of hard to do, I guess. But, but as you said, you, you, you've already said it can't be in line with an outside wall. It has to be inside an outside wall, basically. But people do it six inches or very small. That's right. Way. They've gotten around that part. So. Right. Well, do you, do you say it has to be like three foot or something like that inside? Or, or, well, Fifteen percent, you're limiting a good bit. Oh, I understand that. They have, they have one weird offset. 15% will do it, you think? should. Yeah. I mean, if, if you wanted to take your 15% and put it in a corner, right? then that's up to you, I guess. I don't right. see really anybody doing that in reality. But And what benefit would it be? I think that the idea here is the size right. of it that they're taking advantage of. I'm, I'm going to have to look at uh, some plans when I get uh, back to my office and see crunch them on a, yeah right look at some really figures on that and see what what 15 percent would give me on a normal size house because that ain't a normal size house <laughs> <laughs> right right okay okay with me okay item two under discussion accessory structures <clears throat> i thought we were done well oh, there's two more <laughs> um <coughs> So with this one, uh, 
we are talking about the certain exemptions from the 25% rule for accessory structures. So currently, accessory structures in general have to meet all of these things that I've listed here in italics up at the top of the page. Um, so numbers 2, 3, and 4 in particular are what we're talking about right now. Uh, 2 says that it should be customarily accessory and clearly incidental and subordinate to the principal use and structure. Number 3 says be subordinate in area, extent, and purpose to the principal use or structure. And then number 4 is the one that restricts them to 25% of the <coughs> floor area, mm -hmm. or the heated floor area. Um, but number four goes on to ex ex exempt certain things um, that are typically associated with a single-family dwelling. Uh, and it, then it goes on to give example the two examples of garage and a storage building. That's pretty typical to a residence. Uh, so what I've said here underneath there is basically th the combination of those three uh requirements for accessory structures, the end result is that if you have a single family dwelling, um, your accessory structures are not restricted to 25%. However, they are restricted uh, by number two and three that say they have to be subordinate in area and use. So right now, currently, residential accessory structures live in a space between 25% and 100% of the but, size of the principal structure. Okay, I'll ask a stupid question. If they're not garages or storage buildings, what are they? If those are the ones that are exempt, then what's an accessory? What's the definition of an accessory structure? You could have a structure? pool house. It could be anything. Room. I mean, the list goes on, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Things that I can't think of now, but, Sheds, yeah. Gazebos. Agricultural things, barns. Well, those are those have a different set of yeah, rules. It would yeah. be totally different. I'm yeah. thinking in my backyard. Right. Well, he, like you said, a pool got equipment a, shed. I've got a, well, not a pool house. I about pool just house. like a pool house. Yeah. Well, uh, they can a, get big. A tiki bar, oh, yeah. a gazebo. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. I've seen them with pool tables in them. I mean, they're, they're a pretty good size. They're in keeping with... Sorry, I didn't mean to bring that up and Size confuse the situation. Barns, are, barns have a separate set of rules that allow them to be larger than the house if they're for agricultural use already. Um, what if they're not agricultural use or just a barn? Well, I don't know. I guess they'd be subject to this. Gotcha. I think it does specifically say agricultural use. Mm -hmm. Or it may, is it just the zoning district? So a guy can have a 1,000-square-foot uh, house, but if he's got 50 Corvettes, he can have a monster garage. Correct. Right. Um, well, he can't, actually, technically. He, well, it's, it's exempt. Garages well, it, are exempt. It right? is, but, again, don't forget that um, numbers 2 and 3 in this list at the top that's currently the ordinance language restricts them to be subordinate in area. Oh. Now, look at the first part of number 3. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. what we're here to talk about. I'm glad you said that because what we're here to talk about is, is that what we want to be the case in Curry Tuck, given the fact that there customarily are accessory buildings, especially on the mainland side, that are larger than your house. Right. Say, I, I say, say somebody's got a, likes to build a boat or right. have a big wood shop, and they, they've, had, they've had a small house on this property for a long time. Now they want to build something for their hobby. And cur so currently they can't build anything larger than their home to do that in, the way awesome. the ordinance reads. There's a guy down Grandy Road who keeps adding on, and he's getting almost as big as his house. Right. So you want to allow the accessory structures to be larger than, than, than the... We want to have a discussion about that. Yeah. We're not proposing that it gets changed. Well, I, does it, it sounds good to me. I mean, I, I agree with you. The example you just gave of the guy with a small house and wants to build a garage in the back to work, and he's got the property to do it with. Sure. As he said, maybe somebody has a collection of antique cars. They want a mm -hmm. you know, very right. large metal building. Mm -hmm. It's going to be way bigger than their yeah, house I, is. Right. <coughs> so that's what we're here to talk about. Yeah, I think let, people let should be HOAs allowed to do that. govern neighborhoods. But who are we to govern <clears throat> country roads? Yeah, I think you meet the setbacks. You got the property for. Got the property, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, you're and assuming those things because you're not going to get it on a half acre lot. Exactly. You know, you got to have the area to do it, even if you're putting up a pool building. That's right. Yeah, I like that idea. If you are in a subdivision, the rules of the subdivision will govern that. That's true. Well. Most, most cases, the covenants would say something about that, I would imagine. <clears throat> Um, of course, you know, if if that ends up being what happens, it will require a lot of changes to these um, these requirements that are listed here. The language would have to change mm -hmm. somehow, or somehow just completely exempt them from being subordinate in area and all that sort of thing. <clears throat> so we really just wanted to find out from you your thought. Sorry, your thoughts on you know whether that's an idea that yeah we want to pursue or not. I like that idea. Um, and I don't want to forget to bring this up, although it, it may be a complicated conversation. Um, we have currently accessories, uh, dwelling units that are allowed in the county, and they are limited to square footage between 300 and 1,000 square feet already. Um, Mother-in-law apartments? Mother yes. Apartments <laughs> <laughs> well, Apartments right. over garages, things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Just like we were talking with Sam. Mr. Correct. Yeah. Right. about having accessory. Potential accessory dwelling units. Right. Um, that could be part of a much bigger unit, though, right? I mean, like like if you had a large garage but only a portion of it upstairs. It was, and, and it can also be within the dwelling itself, like the, it, within the principal structure. It could be within that. Yeah. Like a frog? Yeah, or just a separate part of the house, whatever. Like mother-in-law suite or even yep. basement apartment. No if you had basements, basements here. here, yeah, I know a whole lot of basements around <laughs> the mountains. But anyway, but if it's inside the house, it's inside the house. But you're you're concerned because they're putting kitchens in there and yeah, by definition, other bathrooms if you have all three components: sleeping, eating, tax issue more than anything else. Isn't it? Well, I hadn't thought about it like that, but yeah, I suppose it would be. <laughs> because why do we <laughs> care what somebody does? Except but if you, have two you kitchens, know, if, if I put a a a. a, a uh, can you closet in my frog, which is big, then it becomes a bedroom, even though I don't use it. Well, if you had another kitchen in the house right. and then had it out the exterior. Right. Yeah. Can you have two accessory structures? Structures or dwelling units? Um, you can have as many accessory structures as you can fit under your... Dwelling your units. Your, yeah, pervious cover or impervious cover. Two accessory dwelling units. No. So you can't have... Like two kitchens in one house and then an accessory dwelling outside. You can have two kitchens in one house. Well, that'd be an accessory dwelling, right? Not necessarily. Oh. I, I do not know the definition. Of isn't hers kitchens? <laughs> because in order to, be an ex to meet the definition of an accessory dwelling unit, you have to have these three components, sleeping, cooking, and, and sanitary facilities. And they, and they are not just like here's a the second kitchen in our home but they are as a unit together to be used can be used as a separate dwelling unit not necessarily a duplex where you have separate entrances inside and out of the house but it can it by itself can be a dwelling without needing anything else in the rest of the house is that a good way to say it mm -hmm. okay so if you had a master suite with a kitchenette off to the side of it that's an accessory dwelling if you have a bathroom master suite with a bathroom mm -hmm. you yeah so a bedroom with a bathroom like, like a separate entrance even no 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 you said it didn't have to have a separate yeah, entrance. Okay, but I said if you had one, that oh yeah happen. definitely but i understand a separate entrance thing cook from your bed you never have to get up right <laughs> so we're concerned about accessory structures but we're not concerned about 47 trailer bodies that, say again 47 tractor trailer bodies they were used as accessory structures well, they're not supposed to be. Supposed to be. Technically, <laughs> no, boxes you see an awful allowed. lot of them. <laughs> There's a guy out here on the highway. He's got a slew of them. Yep. They're probably just for storage, though. That's, well, is that's that an accessory allowed. structure? What's well, not allowed? Storage in a Connex box or a trailer like that. Right. Permanently. Thank you. Permanent storage Foundation, is not. Foundation, but. You can do it like for construction materials, basically, while you're building some, and then it's got to go. One of the changes you're in, uh, proposing to the thousand square foot accessory structure? Um, we're not necessarily. 
So the issue, the reason I bring that up, um, let's just say, for example, my house. It's it's a thousand square feet, <coughs> and my parents get sick, and they and I want to build them an accessory dwelling unit, which already is allowed to be between three hundred and a thousand. So, I want to. My parents are rich, and they want to build the biggest house to be old in that they can. They come in, apply for a permit, and it's a thousand square feet. Well, which one's accessory, and is one subordinate to the other one or not? We have an issue there where if the if the sizes are similar, they're not going to fit into this category of rules that are, apply to all accessory structures. Let me further clarify that sometimes what happens is that. Somebody will come in, like on a beach lot, for example, and build a garage with an apartment above it that meets the size requirements for an accessory structure, or an accessory dwelling unit, excuse me. And <clears throat> then they will come in later and build a large beach house. So at the time when it was permitted, that was the principal structure, the, the smaller one. Then when they build this other bigger house, it becomes the accessory because it meets the definition of it. And now this principal structure is, or the larger structure is the principal one. So in that situation, it pretty much resolves itself. It just kind of flip-flops. Wow, that that's makes weird. Sense. It, but it's been done. Yeah, but I mean, you know, you build this little garage to live in it while you're building your big house, and you can't build your big house if it's bigger than your yeah, the little bigger. garage that you built. You can, though. You can? That's what I'm saying. And it would automatically flip. Yeah. Office. So it would now, then if, become if you, if the your primary. apartment was 1,200 right. square feet, then you'd have a problem. problem. Right. Because it doesn't meet the size requirements for the accessory. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Unless you change the wording. Well, <laughs> right. Unless we allow bigger accessory dwelling units, which is not why we're here. <laughs> Maybe we are. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we are. Oh, I see. He's got angles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so, so there's one situation. There's the flip-flop where one becomes the other. There's the equal thing, which is probably the, the problem, if there's a problem with the wording here and, and the situation with the, the two different sets of requirements for them. That's pretty and much the accessory right. structure should never be allowed to meet the size of the primary. So the primary is always the primary. Accessory is always the accessory, even if it's only by one square foot. <clears throat> it's clearly defined. Well, then you got the problem with the guy with the big garage. Yep. <coughs> he should have built a bigger house while he was living <laughs> in, his, in his garage. Oh, man, you're cold. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to get a little house. You are little cold. Well, and keep in mind, too, this is a separate discussion because the, these have their own set of rules already. Um, they ha they're supposed to meet these that I've listed up here, these eight rules, and also meet the, the square footage requirements. So I don't know if there's an issue. We just wanted to bring that up for discussion, basically, mm -hmm. to see right. your thoughts on whether that needs to be addressed, whether it's a problem. I'm personally not really seeing an issue with it. If the real question is if they're both a thousand square feet which one do you call the residents which one do you call the accessory yeah and, and not only that but it, it it's this this number two and three Tax department might say it does right. I guess. yeah numbers two and three on the require the or ordinance requirements for all accessory structures would then be an issue potentially yeah i don't like number three you don't like number three no nah, it'd be it, it, accessory structure has to be subordinate in size to the main structure Again, what do you want what about the guy with the big garage? I mean, you know, you, you well, keep in mind it does exempt uh, garages are exempt. Oh, that's right. I, I, yeah. Well, it's again, that goofy accessory structure. You know, what do you use it for? They're exempt from the twenty-five percent rule, but they still have to be smaller than the house, which is what Jeff's point is. Right. Unless it's an agriculture use, can you just do whatever that? And say, say that again. I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. So, unless it's an agriculture use. Then, then you've got the barn exemption, yeah. Can you just do an exemption for a barn and not necessarily have it to be agriculture? Like we were talking about the guy with the antique cars. Well, what makes it a barn and not just a building? 
the, right. the the size of the lot it's on, you know, whether it's used in agriculture. Or well, there's no living space in it either. I mean, the building would have living mm -hmm. space in it. Yeah, but just because he puts up a 8,000 square foot steel building, <coughs> it's never going to be a barn. It's just a big steel building. Right. But if it's on a 400 acre farm, well, you know, then it can be conceivably a, an agricultural use. Mm hmm. For storing tractors or whatever. Whatever, yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Doesn't make any difference. Wow. Do we have to get this settled tonight? Yeah, I, 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 no, you know, I was going to say the same thing. This is, you know, this is a lot to... Uh, we can talk about this again, I hope. This could go on forever. I yeah. think you need a flow yeah, so. chart. Number three. Yeah, <laughs> if then, yeah. Yeah, exactly right. You know, it's, there's a lot Warm of... Warm water infrastructure and maintenance requirements. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you want to talk about that, Donna, real quick? I'm going to give you my chair. That's how you do it, Donna. Donna, you got six minutes. I will make it fast. <laughs> Unless we decide to go past the 10 o'clock. Pass out myself. So. <laughs> I should. I should. Um, major subdivisions. We historically see problems with drainage somewhere down the road with every subdivision. There's a complaint somewhere, whether it be roadside swales, perimeter ditches, inadequate drainage, water backing up. Most of the time it has to do with maintenance. And what we're seeing is farmland develops that farmers no longer maintaining those perimeter ditches, the mm -hmm. outlets, and they become, they become part of the development. They're growing up. They're restricting water flow and in some cases blocking water flow, backing water upstream. So our stormwater board has expressed some, I don't know if that's really what they're called, storm, uh, no, soil and water, water conservation. Soil and water supervisors. Supervisors. <coughs> express concerns with keeping these outlets open, keeping these drainage ditches maintained that have historically been maintained by the, by the farmers. And we've met with engineering and we're trying to come up with some items to go into the stormwater manual that would basically outline how perimeter ditches need to be maintained what needs to be done to them on an annual or every two years, <coughs> every th three years, what needs to be done to keep them open and functional, and who's responsible for that. Homeowners associations historically just say, we, what, I don't maintain, what, that's, I don't maintain that ditch, and really they, it's, it's a function of their subdivision. It's necessary for their subdivision to drain properly. So it's educating the associations, putting the language in the restrictive covenants that opens their eyes to exactly what their responsibilities are. Makes it very clear, driveway culverts, before DOT, and even when DOT takes over maintenance of the street or as they are taking over maintenance of the street, the association has some authority and can get things done instead of them coming to the county all the time. It, it, it empowers the association <coughs> to, to uh, keep these areas up. <coughs> so we have some tools in which to <coughs> Excuse me. To try to address those issues that we'll be bringing back to you probably next meeting. <coughs> that will be UDO modifications. There are stormwater man manual modifications that don't require your action, but we'll bring them to you as well. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a tickle in my throat now. <coughs> <coughs> that means it's 10 o'clock and it's time to go home. Yeah. It means. Get that girl some water. <coughs> yeah. So. Um, next meeting, thank you very much. We will bring that back to you. Um, we may even have some of the supervisors from Soil and Water to come forward and talk about the issues that we are seeing. Do you have active HOAs that don't handle that? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, 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 we have um, active, well, I guess, are they really active? 
<laughs> My, mine is. Yes. There, we have great HOAs. Matter of fact, Eagle Creek is um, getting ready to spend a considerable amount of money, like $30,000, $40,000 to dig out all their ditches. Which well, should, I mean, that, that, I mean, that subdivision is what? 15, 20, I don't even know how, 20 years old, maybe? Yeah. So yeah, it's well, time to start cleaning out those ditches. I mean, they need to be maintained, and they have the money to do it. I just put a culvert in and covered it. <coughs> I, I think a lot of the problem, as you mentioned earlier, and I've heard Eric mention it many times, is the outfalls yeah. that, mm -hmm. for example, Eagle Creek can clean out all their ditches that they have the authority to do. But if it all leads to this one ditch on one guy's property that he won't let anybody on there and touch, and it drains everything for miles, it backs up everything for miles, and that I, I can show you that problem throughout the county. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, yes, it Hurricane exists. Matthew. Everything in my neighborhood goes to one guy's property on a ditch, and he won't let anybody clean it out. Not the county, not the state. We're going to try to take little bites of this big problem um, this is a maintenance piece that we'll bring forth first and there will be other components that we will bring forward at a later date um, but right now that's the one thing to help address maintenance in these in these subdivisions on the perimeter ditches and some of which are outlets that drain upstream properties they're not cleaning out. So um, and won't let anyone else clean and won't out. Won't let anyone them. else clean them out. And are really vital in the overall drainage yes. of an area. Yeah, yeah. major drainage area. Yes, just, just big, big stuff. I mean, you look at the mega site. There are, and I don't want to keep the everybody, what? but excuse me, current talking station. About it. <laughs> there are three ditches that go underneath Caratoke Highway that drain the majority of that development or will drain the majority of that development. They are not maintained outlets. They're overgrown with trees to the point that you can barely even see water. So, um, when does the Army Corps of Engineers already? Leave? Wouldn't that be them? When do they step in? When flooding occurs? Did, did um, they step well, <laughs> uh, generally they don't. Okay. However, we are doing a study to, to look at watersheds in a portion of Moyoc because there were some significant drainage issues that occurred after Matthew. Matthew yeah. Mm -hmm. at, during and after, like oh, yeah, may, yeah, prolonged, yeah. <laughs> that stayed there for a long time and happened even after the storm event left. Um, that they are looking at, but generally they're, they don't do the improvements. Well, not do the improvements, um, but wouldn't they mandate they be done? If they're interrupting the flow? I don't know. It just seems logical to me. Yeah. Okay, people, it's after 10 o'clock. <laughs> Donna, you use seven minutes. I'm sorry. Six. Do we get paid overtime for that? Yeah, we, we, Motion to adjourn, right? <laughs> One second before we adjourn. Does anybody have any announcements? Um, thank, everybody the next month. <laughs> thank everybody that came to the land use plan uh, work session. Thank you. Thank all of thank you all for coming tonight so we can have, have a quorum so we can continue our business. And thank you, staff. I'm always impressed with you guys because y'all know all this stuff and you don't have to look it up or nothing. You already know it. So I, well, <laughs> we didn't know that, so we're impressed. Yeah, we are. And the other thing is this is just quick. Don't dog me. Just you, Lori. One simple answer, yes or no. Is Curry Tuck Station a done deal? Is that name a done deal? As far as I know, yes. <laughs> so even though I have 200 different answers, they don't matter. 200 different suggestions for name other than Curry Tuck Station. That's a housing development, not the thing that they're talking about. I can bring that to the Board of Commissioners, and I will. There are developments that could Sorry. occur in there that could be named something. Like something, <coughs> I don't know, 
That wasn't one of the suggestions, sorry. <laughs> anyway. Huh? Well, anyway, I'm thinking about making a list and taking it to the commissioners their next meeting. <laughs> we'll see. Anyway, if there's no further discussion. What's the name that you want? It's a bunch of them. I don't know all of them. Oh, Lord. Now, I ain't quite all those, and I will be here forever. Anyway, thank you all. Meeting adjourned.